You are listening to I Wrote This Light Novel in Like a Day, It Sucks and I Hate It, but if it gets an anime adaptation, I'll pretend it was a work of genius. An audiobook by Digibro. Yuji Everylead realized that his life was never going to be the same the day that he slipped on a banana peel into his little sister's giant tits, whereupon he promptly suffocated and died. His soul immediately went to hell for the sin of being the main character of a light novel. For 70 millennia, demons would pluck each pubic hair out of his ball sack in random clumps until it was clean enough for them to slap it with a paddle that made hard gay moaning sounds. Fallen angels would watch from the sidelines, giggling at the fate of this poor soul for whom they had no sympathy, because in heaven, light novels don't and have never existed. This is fucking retarded, Anglo-Saxophone angrily spat, staring at the previous paragraph which he had just typed into his text editing program. I know light novels are all about meta-humor and stupid bullshit, but this is taking it too far. He reached down to unplug his keyboard so that he wouldn't be able to commit any further atrocities on the human language for the rest of the afternoon, and at that moment a meteorite crashed directly through his ceiling, continuing on its course about a mile in to the earth below and destroying the planet in its entirety. Mars laughed. I can already tell where this is going. Marty Douche Nozzle then spoke directly into the camera. This is going to be a story that I just wrote, and then something terrible is going to happen to me, revealing itself to be a story that someone else wrote, ad infinitum, with increasingly stupid names, all in an attempt to make the single most immaturely meta crock of bullshit in human history. And then, as soon as the supposed real story starts, it'll go on for like 20,000 words before being revealed to have all been yet another story within a story, right before the entire your novel devolves into a drug trip deconstruction of House of Leaves, eventually emptying out into Conrad Collins talking about himself, killing himself, being a story within a story, everything is the Matrix, nihilism is awesome, stay woke, fuck formalism, kill yourself. Well, okay. Uh, I don't know where to go from there. But, like, it's not as though you had any sense of this having been a real story in the first place. Like, this is a work of fiction, you weren't reading it with some presupposition that it was grounded in something other than trying to entertain you. If a story has a plot hole, does it then eat itself and become a meta black hole from which narrative can't resurface? If I put a plot hole in my story with a wink and a nod, does it become high art? Is postmodernism ruining contemporary society by encouraging this kind of morally relativistic behavior? Or is culture even healthy in the first place? Yak! De culture! More news on the hour, but for now, back to you, Tim. Right. Right. Here's what you need to know about Tanya S. Caliber. She's a blonde British babe with big booming breasts who bangs ballers and busts nuts up and down the Upper East Coast of the USA. But today, she's making a special trip to Japan because her vagina is emitting a signal that the greatest dick in the world is attached to a 16-year-old shut-in otaku living in an outer Tokyo suburb. And she is one of the seven chosen waifus who must journey to his house and compete for the right to take his virginity. The winner is whoever can get him to admit that he wants to fuck them after having done literally everything in their power power to suggest that it would be okay for him to make a move. She is not going to win. Her breasts are too big and her accent is too American. She is not an OTP. She has been preordained to remain a fetish cachet, a checkbox in the center of a Venn diagram, existing to shove her tits around and iron curls into her hair and occasionally strap on bondage gear or crack a whip or something, but ultimately to be voted off the island for being too weird and kinky and niche, thus relegating her to a background character in the third act who shows up for a couple of one-off jokes and then then resigns to five or ten dojins at the next Yukami case to make a couple of bucks for a couple of artists who will move on to the next girl when the time comes. The other six girls are as follows. Boobs Magoo. Boobs Magoo has tits about as big as Tanya's, but she is a proper Japanese woman. She wears kimonos and does tea ceremonies and uses a sword and can shoot a bow and arrow and in comedy scenes constantly rants about wabi-sabi and acts like a pretentious asshole, which is honestly why she's my favorite character in the show, because that's such a stupid idea that I'm proud of it and I will shoehorn it into every conceivable scenario, even though my knowledge of the concept of wabi-sabi is so paltry that I can really only think of two jokes about it, so I'm just gonna repeat those every episode and she'll never do anything else. She'll make jokes, her kimono will keep slipping off because she's drunk on sake all the time, but she'll insist that she's a proper lady and that you're a pervert for noticing. And in the one really serious battle episode, she'll use the Akusoku Zan stance or whatever it's called and kill the enemy in one strike while the opening theme plays in the background. 
What a badass. Next up, we've got Lolly Gonzali, a 12-year-old who was cryogenically frozen in 1929 as part of a secret Nazi experiment, making her technically 80 or something. I'm not sure I can't do math. She still acts like a bratty child, which makes sense because she literally hasn't had any additional life experience in the time that she was frozen, but she will also get serious and dispense nuggets of wisdom more indicative of her age from time to time because the basic principles of psychology have nothing to do with the basic principles of writing retarded characters. Also, she's blonde, her eyes turn up words at the end, she has a fang, twin tails, and she doesn't wear clothes. Ever. On the TV version, her twin tails cover up her nipples, and there are always convenient objects in the way of seeing her snatch, but on the Blu-ray, we find out that she has a vibrator sticking out of her pussy literally at all times. I remind you that she is technically older than your whole family. After that is Fag Hag Grabass, the crass bass of Mount Sass. She is a bass. A fish. A fish person. She's oily. She slips around like a greased up whore, which she literally really is. She actually technically wins the show in the first episode, when she happens to slip off of a nearby rooftop and slide across a variety of neighborhood park slides, each of which launches her onto another one for 16 hours, before finally flinging her through the closed window of the main character's room while he's masturbating, and she lands directly on his dick as he's coming, and she wails in a strange mixture of excitement and pain, while blood explodes from the hundreds of glass wounds covering her body, and the absurdly massive dick of the main guy plunges straight into her uterus, filling it with so much cum that it explodes out onto his own face, and she is impregnated immediately with his child. Which brings us to Fuck Win Best Girl, the daughter of Fag Hag Grabass and the main character. Thanks to her accelerated fish metabolism, Fag Hag gave birth to her child in the same episode that she got pregnant, but since she was technically the prime minister and princess of her homeworld, planet literally who gives a fuck, Fuck Win Best Girl had to be sent back there through a wormhole so that she could be raised by the orcs and bald eagles who raise all bass children on that planet for some fucked up reason. Thanks to the time-space differential between Earth and literally who gives a fuck, this meant that by the time Fuck Win Best Girl was 12, the age that a bass is considered an adult in their culture, only about 12 minutes had passed back on Earth. Therefore, Fuck Win returned to the series only one exposition dump later into the episode as a fully grown adorable fish girl lolly who I'm actually legitimately getting a boner just imagining. I wish I could draw so I could just make porn of all these stupid imaginary characters instead of writing about them, but since I'm a talentless waste of human existence, I'm just going to keep writing about this lolly girl who it is suggested has a mutual desire to have sex with her father. Her actual, legitimate, biological father. How fucked up is that? I mean, it's hot as shit, right? How many of these fucking bitches do I got left? Three? No, two. Okay, I counted. Sick. Alright, next up is, uh, how about shit-eating fart nugget, who cares, I don't, pain in the ass name to type into Galboru. She's, uh, like a space pirate and she's got green hair and she fights by wiping the sweat from under her boobs off on her hand and then rubbing it on people and it's acid or something. She's an alien and her sweat melts people. That makes sense. All of this makes sense. Her vagina looks like a Venus flytrap, which is never actually explained in the series, but I vaguely hinted at it on Twitter in the hopes that my fans would run with it and draw a bunch of fan art of it. But it turns out that Vor is really niche, so there's not a lot of good artists who are actually interested in drawing it, so most of the art I got looked like it was drawn by a couple of autistic 15-year-olds. I still jacked off to it, though, mostly being turned on by the idea that I was popular enough to inspire it. And last but not least, we have Main girl of light novel. She's got tits that are just big enough to fill even a big fat motherfucker's hands, long beige hair, two assholes, no dick, and no real drive to create anything. She is basically built from the ground up to piss off any thinking human being, and to send them into an existential downward spiral, pondering what fundamental disconnect must exist between themselves and their peers for this to be the most popular girl in the show, and the author's idea of an OTP. Every utterance of the word waifu tearing at your soul, every screenshot of her half-naked like a fever dream through hell, like you surely could only see a world this whacked out after several tabs of narcotics. This can't possibly be the actual earth that you actually live on. Who even are you if everything you've identified yourself with can be perverted to such an extreme by everyone else calling themselves the same? Is everyone else broken or is it just you? And why does the prospect of fixing this feel so hideously vile? As though conceding this point would require a full bore lobotomy to everything you've ever thought was right. This is hell. I am in hell. Everything is mind numbing familiar and yet there is nothing that I understand. Words contort in the air on the way from your lips to my ears until I can't believe that I'm hearing what you're saying. I can only ever imagine that this is a trick, a false image being used by some satanic force to lure me into the lake, to walk myself right down to death, never the wiser of the heaven I never got to see. There are forces beyond my control that want me to bend to their will for purposes I will never know. 
know. I am an automaton experiencing reality as a result of chemical computation which can be easily programmed, a simulacrum of the platonic idea of an emotional creature, an unnatural existence in the greater universe of logic beyond any realm of my comprehension. Endings and beginnings are human constructs. The tenth dimension is just as far as we can think. Everything breaks down when you reach Azatoth scale. We are nothing. I am nothing. It is nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. So then there's the main guy, Kill Me Just Kill Me, a black-haired high school dropout who slings coke in between attending neighborhood council meetings with his mom, whom he is openly fucking and literally everyone knows it. She doesn't even mind that he had a baby with the fish lady because she thinks the daughter is cute and is quietly trying to lure her into some kind of lesbian sex triad that she's established amongst the underground elite of the city. That's Tokyo for anyone not keeping track. I realize it's hard to follow all of this if you aren't sucking down enough caffeine to make an elephant outpace a cheetah, but it might help to take notes. Fucking plebeian. Anyway, so one day Boobs Magoo was on her way home when... Wait, which one was that? Ah, fuck it. You win. They all get killed by meteors and this was a story within a story. Yeah, fuck it. We're doing it live. We'll do it live! Love Live! Season 3! They're all idols! Dead! Fuck idols! Fuck you! It was a dark and stormy night in Virginia when my pants fell awkwardly around my waist and I had to maneuver my fat ass in the chair so I could try to readjust them to be comfortable before getting frustrated and just removing them entirely, then snapchatting my sexy underwear look to a cute girl and then getting back to work. This is a light novel. I promise this is a light novel. You've just gotta bear with me for like three more hours. I promise there's light novel in here. I promise. Whoa, motherfucker. Who said you could flip through the rest of the book, muttering under your breath, is it fucking all like this? And reaching whatever conclusion you will have reached, because I honestly at this point have no idea if it will indeed all be like this. Just sit down and enjoy the ride, guy. Hide my snide inside a nice fly-by-night Shanghai badang guy. I hope I die by the time I write more shite. 2,500 words. God damn, this is going to be an ordeal. I think I'll go eat a meal. I need to get out of this rapping mindset, it's really fucking me up right now. You know what? Fuck Aromanga Sensei, I'm pretty sure I would be physically incapable of actually typing 50,000 words in a single day. Like, never mind trying to come up with ideas at a constant rate, I don't even think I could actually type that much in one day, at least not while sleeping or eating or doing anything else. I mean, I fucking literally wrote 25,000 words in one day on my last novel and that was a fucking stretch. It was a physical and mental ordeal. I did take breaks and stuff where I could, but even if I filled those could I have possibly physically have written 50k in one day? Even if we assume their manuscripts aren't a full 50k, I just can't wrap my head around this conceit. Even if it was like three or four days, I'd be perfectly fine with that. That's probably how long this one will take if I really burn away at it the entire time. But this overnight bullshit is just utter inhuman insanity. If this show is supposed to be an over-the-top, beyond-reality cartoon, then why the fuck doesn't it just act like one and go all in on it? I know the author fucking knows how long it takes, so what is his incentive to insist that it took one day as as opposed to, say, a week. Couldn't they have just said it would take a week? It would make no difference whatsoever to the story, and choosing one day just makes the whole thing seem fake and gay. I cannot comprehend this level of incompetence. Jesus fucking Christ. Chapter 2. Oh, are we doing chapter breaks now? Is that a thing that's going on? Okay, sorry, just had to make sure I'm keeping up with what's coming out of my fingers. Sorry, I totally ruined the blank slate. Just start up another one. Chapter 3. The White-Haired Girl in the Stone Tower. Somewhere that you assume is probably in Eastern Europe, based on your pop cultural knowledge of the area, stands a huge stone castle, probably from like the 1600s or something, because why the hell wouldn't it be? Sitting in the high tower of this castle in one of its little window things is a beautiful silver-haired goth lolly vampire girl. For the sake of argument, let's just say she looks exactly like Romelia Scarlet, but is different enough in subtle ways to be legally distinct. Her name is Captivatingly Beautiful. If you're having a hard time imagining this scene because I'm not good at describing stuff, or because I'm taking such a weirdly glib meta tone with this story, then just watch the opening scene of Tsukuyomi Moon Phase, and that's basically what I'm describing. Captivatingly Beautiful is a clean 300 years old, because if it was a more specific number, then you'd just refer to her as being 300 anyway, so why even make it complicated? The last thing I want is for someone to ask me how old my character is, and for me to look like an idiot because I can't remember the specific number I said because I just round to the nearest hundred, and then get laughed at by a bunch of accountants or something. Anyways, the point is that she looks like a 10 
10 year old or something but she's actually old as shit which means she's not only legal to have sex with but I can basically give her any conceivable personality and it'll make sense because she's already so distant from reality that I can get away with anything which is perfect because all I really care about is the aesthetic of the ancient lolly and if I could get one in every conceivable personality type then I can just take my pick from there which is why it kind of pisses me off that they always go for the same haughty pseudo lolly attitude when they make characters like this like to me the most interesting thing about immortality is that it would give you the time to become more worldly and you'd constantly be learning new things and changing and who actually finds the personality of a bratty child attractive what is wrong with you I just like tiny girls because they're tiny I don't want them to come across as dumber than me what is the appeal of an immortal if they're not even smart fucking weak so anyways captivatingly beautiful is also a cool smart genius that's her nickname cool smart genius or coos gen in fan circles she knows so much complicated stuff that it would be pointless for me to try to describe it because it's stuff that I don't actually know about so in the process of trying to describe it I would end up dumbing it down making her seem less intelligent than she's actually meant to be if you're someone who's smarter than me who would actually be able to understand the things that she can understand then I apologize for my inability to convey her thoughts to you I'm sure you're always looking for something smart and interesting to reach up to your level and most of what you consume on a day-to-day -day basis vaguely lets you down or leaves you with a pervasive lack of fulfillment which only once in a blue moon gets blown away by something so brilliant it briefly reminds you of why you're human like a kindling at a dark souls bonfire i'm sorry i can't keep you from going hollow so yeah coos jen knows everything she also gets down like nobody's business she is amused by people who can at least attempt to verbally spar with her like some kind of monogatari character but not as snappy and glib and vaguely obnoxious she is capable of just shutting the fuck up and chilling out on the roof with you just looking up at space and smoking a cigarette and feeling the cool breeze and appreciating raw sensation that never really gets old because thoughts can just about be run out and excessive but experience keeps going and going which is why food is maybe better than books in the long run i want to have sex with coos jen i want to marry coos jen i want to spend the rest of my short mortal life with coos jen and have her lovingly stroke my hair on my deathbed and then bury me in her backyard or eat me or whatever she does that's all that actually matters here if I tried to tell a story about this character, it would really just be in the name of having a fleshed out idea of this person because I fantasize about being with someone like this. It's all just a vicarious exploration of my deepest held desires, which I am desperate to materialize in any conceivable form, even if it's just making a more solid image in my imagination or creating it in the minds of others so that it exists in a broader shared consciousness and therefore expands its sensation of existence. Oh shit, did I just find the meaning of writing for myself? This isn't going to work. I'm never going to be able to write an actual story at this rate because I can't actually concoct characters and stories which exist for the sake of themselves. I have spent a decade to view narrative as a springboard for analysis of the purpose of its existence and how it both affects us and what about us it brings into existence, so the idea of just creating a story without internally analyzing it constantly is just alien to me. This is why even when I write prose these days, it's all non-fictional gonzo storytelling. I am broken to fiction. Send help. Chapter 4 about eight years ago, I had an idea for an expansive fanfiction series called Ultimate Lolly Apocalypse. The idea was that it would be an epic crossover fanfic starring exclusively lollies from as many different anime as I could think of. The main characters would be Sakura and Tomoyo from Cardcaptor Sakura, but I always struggled with the idea of which other characters would be relevant because, as proven by Cardcaptor Sakura itself, those two characters have enough personality and chemistry to carry a story by themselves, and other lollies would probably feel extraneous. But more importantly, I just never had an actual idea for the story. I was so into the aesthetic idea of a bunch of lollies from various anime going on an adventure that I desperately wanted to create that story, but for years I just never made it past the basic concept. This is how most of my attempts at fiction went. I would construct a concept, sometimes very extensively, that I wanted to create a story around, but just could never come up with an actual story. And to a lot of people, that might seem minor and bare bones and like no huge loss, but to me it was always a massive loss. These stories are so specific in their aesthetic sense, and there are no other stories stories that have the feel that I wanted them to have. Each was meant to communicate some piece of my soul, some inner obsession that I needed others to comprehend because I could never possibly explain them as vividly as they could be conveyed in a story. But I just never came up with the stories. I have perhaps 60 different story concepts laying around, all still banging around the back of my mind and, and just not enough meat to them to be made into actual books. Instead, I have this monstrosity. I am a human failure. Chapter 5 Kagami Anamali is running home from school with toast in her mouth. 
Everything that she does is backwards. She is literally retarded. Everyone at school knows this, but they think she's adorable because she's 10 out of 10 cute and does dopey shit and falls over herself and it's hilarious. But she's got such a good attitude about it that you hardly even feel guilty. What a cool retarded girl. Everyone loves her. In the doujins, guys are always taking advantage of her idiocy to trick her into sex, but she ends up loving it anyways because of course she would. She doesn't know better. In those books, her tits are like three times the size of what they are in the show, which pisses me off, but what can you do? It's never the characters I actually like who get the doujins I actually like. It's always some fucking con cole or love life bullshit, god damn it. Chapter 6. Okay, it's Dead Nigger Storage. He's played by Quentin Tarantino in a film by Takashi Miike, but this is the anime segment. He's running to school with toast in his mouth, even though he's a 50-year-old man. His gigantic titties are flopping up and down, even though he's a 50-year-old man. His dunk ass is peeking out from under his bobbing skirt, even though he's old as all shit and a white American film director with a profoundly racist name that I can get away with because I'm down with the homies and shit. And also, this is high art and you can't tell me what to do. This shit is meaningful. I can prove it. It means, uh, uh, shit. Move on to the next chapter. Chapter 7. I'm gay. Chapter 8. One mammoth-sized, fat, heavy guitar note blares at max volume from the Tower of Sun amplifier cementing shut the garage door in Aaron Yagire's house. Everything in the room is rattling from the intensity of this thunderous drone, and Erin stands affixed in a pose with her right arm to the sky, pick in hand, staring intently down at the vibrating strings on her beat-to-shit guitar, pulverized by as much metal thrashing as her tiny young body could muster in the seven years she's had it. She waits until the blood has already largely rushed from her hand, and it's just about to go numb in the same way that her ears have gone minutes ago, before finally and violently striking the pick over the strings once more, producing a blast of sound which shudders the very earth beneath her feet. She doesn't even hear a small ceramic cup falling from the table in the neighboring room and shattering across the floor. There is no caution in her soul. She isn't even wearing earplugs. She's only 22 and she'll probably have tinnitus by the time she's 30, but she couldn't possibly give less of a shit for now. This is the life that she's chosen, the one that is meant for her, reckless abandon into the pulsating sonic waves of pure drone overkill. And then, just when she's about to strike those strings once more, to crush the air all over again, her drummer joins in. The sheer force of Alexa Excellence kick, snare, and crash cymbal all blasting at once alongside the first droning bass chord from Beatrix Waifu's down under tuned bass cracks one of the garage's windows. All three girls have torn into their music so hard that the foundation of the house itself is cracked, and they will have long since skipped town by the time the landlord finally discovers structural damage beyond what he can explain or afford to deal with. If they played long enough, the earth itself might just split and plummet them all straight to hell where their rock off against the devil will almost certainly end in their victory. These girls were drunk as hell and utterly unstoppable. Then Erin stepped up to her microphone and her entire throat rended itself raw as the entirety of her soul escaped through a pained, magnificent screech so abrasive and overblown that a 90-year-old neighbor three houses down the street just died immediately. When the cops showed up, the girls couldn't hear the sirens. When they busted down the door to the garage wearing protective helmets over their soundproof headphones, they still staggered at the sound, and the girls didn't even notice. When each of them was apprehended, they just went on screaming and screaming, screaming for the world to give them back their friend, to give them back Amy Armstrong, the only lead guitarist on planet Earth who could make angels weep bloody tears of hatred for their own god with her shredding prowess. She had immolated herself on the front lawn of the White House, before a bomb in her stomach blew a flurry of secret servicemen to smithereens. The other girls were not sad that she was dead. They were upset that they couldn't come with her. That they'd had to live in the world that she'd left behind. That she would have to take over hell on her own while she waited for them. Before the first cop could grab Aaron's arms, she managed to knock his helmet off. He got both of her hands behind her back, but he was unguarded to deal with someone so untamed. Her teeth shot up for his cheek, and once she'd fully taken grip, she ripped her head as fiercely as she could to the side and tore his entire face off. The man fell to the ground and screamed to death, and Aaron was shot 15 times by the other three cops in the room, one of whom was then killed by his own bullets cursedly perfect ricochet off of the sun amplifiers, which were now billowing feedback and horrific squeals from the half-unplugged guitars and microphones knocked onto the floor. Alexa jammed a drumstick through an officer's neck just in time for a bullet to go right through her eye socket and out the back of her skull. In those five frenzied seconds, Beatrix had gotten her bass high 
high above the last officer's head and beat him to the ground with it, and then mercilessly pounded on his spine again and again until it was mush. Backup was already headed into the building, so she punched her head into the center of one of the amps and began blasting bass tones into her eardrums until they shattered, but she kept right on thumping at the strings harder and harder until the vibrations lobotomized her. When the backup police finally made it into the garage, the place was stone silent and everyone was dead. Chapter 9 Jesus Christ, that story was fucked up. I thought it was going to be about a bunch of cute girls who were into cool noise music, but then somehow it turned into a cop-killing terrorist sleeper cell of bath salt broken batshit bonanza. I can't control what happens here, folks. After that first paragraph, I legitimately thought I might tell an entire long-form story about these characters and in this scenario, and then I somehow immediately and gruesomely murdered all of them. That was not even slightly intentional. I am just out of my fucking mind. And now I still don't have a stable of characters around whom I can stabilize this stupid ass book and have it chug along on autopilot for a while. Writing fiction is hard. Come to think of it, this is probably why I wrote so much flash fiction back in the day. I totally forgot about that. Weird. Anyways, that story was inspired by the Boris album Absolute Ego, which I've been listening to for most of this writing process so far. So give that a listen if you want to be inspired to churn out a non-stop chain of morbid and horrific prose, I guess. Or if you like drone and are really high or something and you need to forget the existence of time and go on a spirit journey or some shit. Chapter 10. Can love truly blossom on the battlefield? By which I mean the metaphorical battlefield of domestic family life. By which I mean, if brother fights sister, can brother also fuck sister? I aim to find out. It doesn't count if they're not blood related, you fucking cowards. Here's how you do it, cunt. This is Mike Pence, a 16-year-old Japanese high schooler living at home with his family and doing normal-ass boring teenager shit. But also, he knows a bunch of otaku terminology because the author is fucking inept and can't finish a sentence in his own mind without some kind of internet meme popping up. So just ignore that and pretend like this character is consistent or makes any fucking sense. His little sister is Motoko Kusanagi, an inexplicably purple-haired cute little girl who goes to middle school, listens to nothing but fucking My Chemical Romance, has a razor hidden in her bedside drawer so that she might cut her wrists but has never actually broken the skin, and hates everyone at her school. She and her brother haven't really been talking for the last few years, but one day she has to come to him for help because of her wacky secret. While pretending to cut herself, Motoko accidentally actually slit her wrists. What will she do if mom and dad find out? After letting her bleed profusely all over his floor while exchanging 15 minutes of pleasantries in the form of misunderstandings, pointless bickering, and at one point, Mike slipping on Motoko's blood, causing him to faceplant into her hooch, to which she is none too pleased, Mike finally takes Motoko to the hospital. After taking one look at Mike's completely dead sister, the doctor flicks his tongue against his teeth and announces that the only thing now is to turn her into a full-body cyborg. And so, after promptly removing Motoko's human brain and throwing it directly into the garbage where it belongs, the doctor then spent the afternoon crafting a technological marvel of scientific ingenuity, a completely original cyborg which looked nothing like Mike's sister Motoko Kusanagi and everything like the main character of Ghost in the Shell, Motoko Kusanagi. Upon returning home, Mike's parents were impressed with his sister's growth spurt, especially with her sudden bust enlargement. Everyone got a real kick out of that one over spaghetti at the dinner table. Mike then escorted the new Motoko up to her bedroom, whereupon he immediately began viciously nailing her cunt for hours on end, until he'd nutted over every square inch of his former sister's still blood-soaked belongings. Once he finally passed out, rolled off of the bed onto an upturned knife and died instantly as it went through his heart, Motoko finally decided to take some agency and head downstairs for some orange juice. On her way to the kitchen, she happened upon Mike's father, now completely childless, jacking off in the dark while watching kitty porn on the family computer in the den. Sensing her presence, he paused the video, embarrassed, scurried over, and started fondling her tits while apologizing for his rudeness and tossing in complaints about how he missed his opportunity to get into that pussy while it was still young and tight. Motoko then caught the scent of an errant fart and karate chopped his head in half horizontally, sending the top half spinning through the air like a frisbee and crashing into a hung portrait of his dead kids back when they weren't dead. Feeling like there was a loose end waiting to be tied, Motoko decided after drinking her orange juice to go up to the mother's room and see how she might feel about everything which had just transpired. After describing the story in great detail, but for some reason superfluously suggesting that both her son and husband were endowed with enormous penises, which simply had not been true at all and she knew it, the wife breathed a sigh of relief from so deep in her body and lasting for so much longer than a mere moment that she actually began aging backwards until she had shrunken too much to fit into her own clothes 
clothes and become an adorable 10 year old child again. Motoko, being a gay pedophile, was instantly in love and decided to illegally adopt her by grabbing her around the waist, leaping from the windowsill in one clear arc from their home in Japan to an unnamed island hundreds of miles south from the mainland, and they spent the rest of their year cuddling and having a good time and being adorable together before the nuclear holocaust eradicated all life on Earth. Then it was just Motoko by herself, as the only successfully completed humanoid robot on the planet, and she just built herself a new lolly waifu to hang out with, and it wasn't even that big a deal. She didn't even really miss the old one, because she'd still kind of had the personality of the crotchety old bitch that she'd been beforehand, and it was kind of a turnoff, whereas this new model actually acted like an adorably precocious kid, and that was cool, and it was like she was kind of its mom, but also its wife, which was the entire strike zone of her weird robot kink, so basically this was a complete win in the end. Fuck yeah, nuclear winter. Chapter 11. All of the surviving characters of all of the previous stories didn't die in the nuclear winter because they were in the middle of a trans-dimensional space adventure. That's an adventure that takes place across multiple dimensions, not a dimension on an adventure to explore its gender identity. Also, all of the characters who died in those stories were connected in some kind of weird esoteric web that led to most of the story events happening. Just take my word for it, everything in this book is densely interconnected and meaningful. It's a standalone complex. Just wait for someone to start making analytical theory videos about it and I promise it'll make sense. You cannot think of this as a short story collection and therefore technically disqualified as an actual light novel. Actually, I've read some light novels that were anthology style, so I don't even know why I'm bending over backwards for this conspicuous disclaimer. Fuck you, I win. Chapter 12. I bet you're surprised that I'm just like actually counting up chapter by chapter numerically and not doing anything fucky with it, like using random other numbers or giving them all funny titles. Honestly, that shit's been done a million times. In fact, I've done it in my own past work, Cyrano and Purple Steve. I'm trying to get this thing written in like a day, so I'm not going to overcomplicate it any more than it already is just by the nature of its existence. Each one of these chapter breaks is just a way to make a clean slate, but to do it in a way that I can also say out loud for the audiobook version which wouldn't be clear if I was just using regular text breaks. It's just to denote all of the massive changing gears that happen in this book, and to allow me a chance to start fresh and potentially construct a longer stretch of fictional narrative this time, in the vain hopes of one of these stories actually running for long enough to pick up some real momentum, and not just abruptly devolve into some kind of weird, violent, psychosexual rambling that sounds like something Patrick Bateman would write as a 13-year-old. God, I'm so fucked up. Chapter 13 a bitch is eating ice cream off a of dyke's tits in Times Square. Sure is a hot day. hey -o. Chapter 14. But Peter, I don't work at Boyga King. <laughs> Chapter 15. Yuji got with Yuki. Yuki got Sayuri. She had shared Sayuri's outlook on the topic of disease. Saito had a facial scar and Kenji was a racist. They were all in love with dying. They were doing it in Saitama Prefecture. Okay, making this weird obscure joke is actually taking more effort than the usual stream of consciousness stuff because I have to think of real Japanese names and also remember the lyrics to Pepper by Butthole Surfers. So forget it. Cancel the whole thing. Go back to the nonstop string of violent anime memes. Stevo the vampire was the most powerful being in the Eastern Hemisphere. He'd killed every wolf in St. Petersburg and fashioned their pelts into a gigantic coat fit only for a giant, which he was not, and no such thing exists, so it was really more of a symbolic gesture, but the garment served little purpose in reality. One day he was getting his salt and pepper on when, whoops, garlic, spilled all over his lap, melted right through his porcelain dick, and splattered onto the ground below. Oh well, he thought, finally get to put my immortal powers to use and grow my dick back, as I've always been completely sure that I'm able to do. But the poor bastard quickly and feverishly came to the horrific realization that his dick could not, in fact, grow back, because he was a vampire, not a fucking salamander. After experiencing each stage of grief in painful sequence, he finally calmed down, reassured himself that life would still be worth living, and that there might even be medical options for dealing with this. But ultimately, these reassurances weren't very convincing, and in a rush of desperate agony, he tossed the cap off of the garlic shaker, which he was now sure he must have kept around just for this day, and dumped it down his throat, melting away his insides until he was completely destroyed. Chapter 17. So one day I was walking home from my job at the salad factory when suddenly it hits me. Oh yeah, I did collect all seven Dragon Balls, didn't I? I rummaged through my pockets for a bit and sure enough, bam, all seven Dragon Balls right there in my specially crafted Dragon Ball carrying case. Fucking sick, bro, I said in a flat monotone, nothing like how that exclamation made it sound just now. I was dead fucking serious, as I always am, because I'm a stone cold motherfucker who kills mothers in their sleep just so I can see my clown god again for a brief nod of approval, assuring me that I'm allowed to continue living until the doubts creep back. 
So anyways, I summoned Shenron, and I won't repeat any of what he said here because he was clearly performing a highly offensive stereotypical Mexican-American accent, and I am not going to condone his actions here. I know that Shenron has it in him to be a good person when he wants to be, but his insensitivity can really be an issue sometimes, and he just refuses to acknowledge the damage that he's doing to the more sensitive members of the community. In our more hushed moments behind closed doors, we've taken to referring to him as a right cunt, but I'm afraid that if we confront him about his attitude, then he'll just get defensive and double down and make things worse. It seems on some level that even if he doesn't agree with the criticisms levied against him, he's at least begun to recognize that his presence causes something of a rift within the community, and he started to make himself scarce and to only appear before people who can handle his more risque sensibilities, even if we really are just silently dealing with them as people who want to keep things together and from getting hostile and don't actually approve of the way that he presents himself. Shenron, I wish I was dead. My wish was granted. Very soon I found myself narrating the last 15 minutes of my thoughts to myself as they flashed before my eyes in the brief instant that my consciousness flickered before flipping off, and it was just as I became aware of exactly what I was doing in that moment that I ceased to perform it. I mean, I assume so, I'm still in the narrating process right now, but this feels like I'm dying, so I guess if you don't hear anything else from me or there's a chapter break after the sentence, then just assume I'm dead. Chapter 18 Once upon a time not too long ago, when people were yukatas and lived life slow. You get where this is going, right? Cool, fill in the rest yourself. Chapter 19. It is at this point in the story that I feel I must alert you to the fact that this is, in fact, a book. And as I'm sure you realize and have just remembered with alarm, books are gay. Ergo, in reading, or more likely listening to, this book, you are now gay. Now don't worry, a lot of my friends are gay and all of them are really cool, so you're in good company. I just thought you might like to be told as early as possible so that you can start preparing to make the proper life adjustments. If you're already gay, then you've got nothing to worry about. Carry on as you are. If you weren't gay before, you may want to consult the nearest gay for advice on how to live from now on. Hopefully you'll find it an enriching and enjoyable experience and nothing to be concerned about at all. Now that you've had time to process this revelation, I hope you'll continue with this story, perhaps with a newfound appreciation for the literary arts and what they have to offer. Oh, and congratulations. Chapter 20. Baron Womb Academy is a high school in the far reaches of the Japanese desert, where young maguses and mages and magicians and witches and wizards and dark magician girls and magical girls and magical witches and magical warriors and monster girls and meisters and mudbloods and moogles go to school to learn the bright arts of Balthazar Bungholio. The academy is home to 100 students, broken up into 18 different magical weight classes, identifiable by their significantly different school uniforms. I will now detail them extensively. Class 18, Brouhaha and Ballyhoo. B&B &B is the weakest of the bright art classes, consisting of the Academy's four weakest classmates, known colloquially by their self-appointed nickname, the Rowdy Shitheads. Each of them has powers a couple of notches above parlor tricks, but useful for esoteric service industry jobs that they will probably get stuck in for the rest of their lives. They're all total fucking idiots too, so it's not like they really have any other prospects, not that they understand this. Because no one takes them seriously, and their teacher is a duck, they spend most of their time bumming around in the classroom, doing drugs, and kicking the trash can over. Every once in a while, their teacher quacks, and each of them has a stunning revelation about how to fine-tune their powers, but they can never force the teacher to quack again, no matter how much they try, because it outclasses them as a level 96 ethereal summon lord, and therefore they can't get within 6 inches of it without losing one of the knuckles on whichever finger sticks out the farthest. Most of them are already missing the first part of their middle finger, which is particularly unfortunate for someone who enjoys using it as much as any of them does. The students are as follows. Ragtag Ragamuffin, the eldest son of House Ragamuffin, who live in the maze-like sewers beneath the school. His father is a half-rat demi-guy, and his mother is a Thai prostitute, who, it is sad to think, is legitimately living a much better life here than she was on the streets. Because high-level mages are able to produce magical antidepressants and bliss drugs out of thin air, and therefore see no value in them, because what the fuck do they care, they're magic, nothing ever makes them upset, they often generate gigantic torrents of them and flood them into the sewers, placating the populace below. Ergo, Ragtag's parents are pretty fine with their situation and aren't really complaining, they get by. Ragtag, meanwhile, has spiked red hair, a bad attitude, and a cancer-ridden dick. Doctors say that he will probably live another 20 years and that the cancer might even be beatable, but he's okay to go to school, and as best he can, not think about it for now. His special power is that anyone existing in a 30 meter radius of him while he's playing Game Boy will poop four times faster. It is most likely that he'll be hired to work at a 
highway rest stop at some point, where he will get in trouble constantly for forgetting that he's at work and wandering off to piss in the woods and wonder where the hell he is or how he got there. Luckily, since Ragtag grew up with literally nothing but the rags on his ass, he is very easily captivated by anything even marginally interesting. So when the Academy gave him his first Game Boy, he became addicted to the point of scarcely looking up, except to swear at and flip people off with his nub of a middle finger. When he gets particularly enraptured in the game he's playing, a faculty member will sometimes come by with a moving lift and slide it under his feet, then wheel him over to the nearest bathroom when there's a backed up line thanks to a broken toilet or something. He usually doesn't realize that he's been moved until he gets hungry, at which point he will eat a bag of generic chips that has been left at his side and go back to playing the Game Boy. One time he stood outside the bathrooms on the school's east side for 89 hours, passing out every so often and collapsing, only to wake up with no idea what had happened and get right back to playing games. He holds his pants up with a bullet belt full of AA batteries and can change out the batteries in a Game Boy in less than three seconds from the moment it goes dead, usually chucking the used batteries down the hallway in the process. One time he put someone's eye out doing that and got the living shit kicked out of him, but he didn't even really process the situation and still has no idea that he caused it. The next member of B&B is Ass 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 Ass, a girl with a big ass. Ass Ass is most often referred to by others as Ass Girl, which is usually intended to be derisive, but since it's almost literally her name, she doesn't even really notice. Ass Ass has infinitely purple hair and an overall pretty nice body, which is by and large overshadowed by the quality of her ass. People behind her have such a tendency to yell, God damn, when following her that she honestly believes it's a standard greeting. Basically, the point is that her life of possessing a giant ass has perverted her overall understanding of social norms. SS has the power to read really, really fine print. Yeah, that's right, her power actually has nothing to do with her ass. Who'd have thunk it? There are literally catty girls at school who look at her derisively because they think she's using her powers to make her ass bigger to seduce guys into doing things for her. But nope, she's just naturally got a big huge ass. Her power is that she reads too small of text, which is only so helpful because she's not particularly literate. She can read the words out loud for whoever is asking her to, but she doesn't always comprehend the meaning of what she's reading, nor does she care enough to ask. I'm not even all that sure what kind of job this power would be useful for, but the Academy figured they'd think of something by the time she graduates, and it's not like she was doing any good at regular school growing up anyways. Besides, having more students gives them all kinds of tax benefits, and with a lot of the high class magic kids getting poached by bigger academies like Japan Pro Magic and St. Big Dude's Big Ol' Custard College, they need all the attendance they can scrounge together. While SS is generally an alright student, insofar as she shows up to class every day, she is vacant to the point of seeming to live on autopilot most of the time, and completely unable to hold a conversation. Guys who try to hit on her because they think she might be easy since she's kind of dumb and has a huge ass, usually find themselves unable to penetrate her straightforward, unintentionally curt answers and baffling readiness to disclose unwanted information, and come away more confused than horny. As such, she is a virgin, like the rest of her class. The third of these shit-eating idiots is Boopy Doodle, a would-be 12-year-old genius, except that he's actually a full-blown moron. So basically, he's just a 12-year-old who's in high school. Because Baron Womb Academy doesn't have any grades below high school, and his parents were able to get government benefits if they enrolled their son there, since his powers seemed really promising, and the school wanted to get him before any of the others could. Unfortunately for them, Boopy's powers were highly overestimated by their outdated and underfunded magical prediction ward. It was only in hindsight that the enrollment office realized that if this kid was as promising as they thought, then he would have been found by the scouts from the better schools long before they could have gotten to him. They were just so sure that because he was local, they'd gotten lucky and stumbled on him first, but they were pretty quickly and dramatic humbled. Of course, having another student was still a tax break, and they couldn't exactly admit to the family that they'd taken their barely functional child out of public schooling and moved them across town just to make them take him back. So they stuck Boopy in the magical retard class. Boopy's power, suggestive of so much potential, was thought to be the manipulation of electricity, one of the objectively coolest superpowers about which an entire comic book empire could have been established. Of course, right before any brand deals could be established, the duck report came in to the higher-ups that Boopy's power is more accurately described as acting as a preamp. In other words, if you put, say, a microphone's XLR cord in his mouth and then run a USB cord from his ear to a computer, then he can convert clean audio. This job can also be done by devices that cost about a hundred bucks, and Boopy only outputs enough voltage to power like three devices at once, so he's basically entirely useless. He's also a shitbag little punk who wipes boogers on other people's desks and laughs about it, plus he's ugly as sin now that he's had 
had seven knuckles raised off his fingers. So at this point, everyone's just kind of hoping he'll accidentally fall down an elevator shaft while trying to prank someone and kill himself. Last but not least of this cunt cadre is Crocodile Kyle. Yes, that is his first and last name in order. Croc is able to communicate with crocodiles, which is almost entirely useless, because crocodiles are fundamentally different animals from humans, so it's not like he can be an in-between for humans and crocodiles. He at best can talk to a crocodile as though he himself were also a crocodile, which is only useful for, like, convincing a crocodile to move out of the way of whatever it might be in the way of. Plus, he's kind of a whiny douchebag, so crocodiles don't generally get along with him anyways, unless they're slow and easily influenced. Croc is convinced that he's got a real one-of-a-kind talent and that he's incredibly useful to the world as a human ambassador to crocodiles, even though literally no one thinks that. Everything he wears or owns is green, which everyone just finds gross, and most girls are convinced that he's a crocodile fucker. While he does spend a lot of time at the lakeside, he doesn't actually really do much talking to crocodiles, since crocodiles are boring as hell in general. Instead, he just sits around and smokes cheap cigarettes and throws the butts into the lake. God, can we move on to a less depressing class now? Class 17, Ballers and Bad Babes. Aw oh, yeah, now this is a class. B&BB &B is where the cool kids hang out. These kids have sex. These kids throw parties. These kids know how to neck a fat dick. These kids are hotter than your parents in their glory days, and they can do magic. B&BB &B consists of just one student, Alonzo Flyboy, whose special power is being every sex and gender and sexuality all at the same time, and somehow being capable of literally fucking themselves in any conceivable way that you can imagine. They is the happiest human being on earth, and the general knowledge of their existence brightens the day of anyone who knows about them. As such, Alonzo has been appointed as the official school mascot, and a statue of them blowing themselves has been erected on the academy front lawn. If only I could be so fucking based! Class 16, Baron Womb Academy's Finest. This is by far the biggest class in the entire academy, consisting of 51 students. All of them have generic, cliched fantasy powers, like conjuring fireballs, chucking lightning, and manipulating PMS cycles telekinetically. Each of them is enlisted in the Japan Super Fighter Secret Army, where they will be drafted to fight in the country's bloody and long-running shadow war against the Zimbabwe Moon Wizard Society. Only five of them will survive into their 20s, and they will be the unlucky ones, haunted for the rest of their lives by the visions of imploding heads, skinless manlets screaming as their muscles corrode, live-action vor, and the realization that there has never been meaning in the universe. Each will commit suicide, either by magical drug overdose, their own powers, or gun. It's best that I not dive into any of these students individually, lest you become depressed by thinking about their ultimate fates. Class 15, Sally and Steve. Sally and Steve are one of those cute couples who just take things way too far. Like, they're always holding hands, all of their clothes match, they have a full lexicon of gross-sounding pet names that would make anyone cringe. They're the couple that your boyfriend brings up when you complain that he's not showing you enough affection and he tries to dodge out of it by jumping to the logical extreme situation. No one wants to ask them what their powers are because they probably have cooties. Class 14, Assholes. Okay, before I explain how assholes work, I'm going to have to give you an extensive rundown of the properties of the Bright Arts which are taught at Baron Womb Academy. Up to this point, I've mostly been covering irrelevant dipshits who just signed up for whatever Magic Academy would take them, and were accepted because, frankly, there aren't enough practitioners of the Bright Arts to justify building an entire academy for them. And were accepted because, frankly, there aren't enough practitioners of the Bright Arts to justify building an entire academy for them. And if it wasn't for the massive government subsidies poured into the school to train up all of those soldiers, then they would be able to afford a place dedicated to the practice of such obscure arts. The Bright Arts were conceived of by Balthazar Bungholio in the early 20th century, around the time that TV was starting to become a thing and everyone was like, fuck the printing press, I'm an idiot and I just get my news from pictures, I don't care about anything. Balthazar was a hermit who thought everybody was dumb and lame, so he spent half a decade coming up with retardedly complex magic systems on his father's dime, because his father was too busy running his corporation and had given up on his firstborn son as soon as he realized that his second son wasn't such a disappointment. Balthazar would have been nothing more than a prototypical nerd, were it not for the fact that one day he mustered up the willpower to leave his room and to try to visit the site of a supposedly mystical rune comet which had crashed into the mountainside in some fuck-off Japanese country town. Since he didn't have a license, he took four trains to get to the place, all while growing in ire for everyone around him just for being normies, and constantly thought about turning back because this was a dumb idea and it was probably fake anyways. When Balthazar finally arrived at the place where the crash took place, 
place, he was equally ecstatic and horrified to realize that holy shit, there actually was a big moon rock in a crater in the mountainside. None of the locals gave a shit because frankly it seemed like no big deal. They were just glad it didn't hit anyone's house because they're normal, functional, empathetic people with real world concerns and better things to do. Balthazar was terrified to actually touch the stone because he's a coward in general and he was convinced that maybe he'd get mind raped by Cthulhu tentacles or some bullshit, but since he wasn't actually sure he had enough money to make it home and was afraid to find out, he decided to embrace destiny and go touch the thing. Upon doing so, an enormous white bushy beard erupted out of Balthazar's pristine fat neck and he became a powerful wizard. All of his most asinine ideas about magical systems immediately became reality, inconsistencies, redundancies, and retcons intact, and he gained all the worldly wisdom of some old guy who'd been to most of Eastern Europe and a few Asian countries. He also begrudgingly gained the knowledge that his nipples would become hard whenever he was within a mile of someone else who had the potential to practice the bright arts that he'd created. But for years, he decided to completely ignore this and pretend he was the only one, and spend most of his time in his room using spells to teleport drinks onto his desk or to evaporate shit out of his pants so that he'd never have to get up. It was around a year later that a spunky young dark magician girl by the name of Alexa Beatrix intervened by arriving at his house, eager to learn more about the burgeoning power that she felt welling within her. Balthazar avoided eye contact and attempted to shoo her away, but was so bamboozled by her enthusiastic description of how she was guided to his place by the hardness of her nipples that he ended up letting her into his house to take a look at his scrolls. In spite of Balthazar's pretentious and cowardly demeanor, Alexa continued to visit his house every couple of days to learn more about the bright arts, ignoring the increasingly obvious sexual tension bubbling in Balthazar's brain to buckle down and try to wrap her head around his needlessly complex writing. Over the course of about five months, Alexa was quickly disillusioned to her mentor's wisdom and the level of care which he'd actually put into his own magic system, and realized that she had a better grasp on it than he did, a fact which he probably understood on some level but would never admit in his actions, continually to be curt and standoffish towards her and insist that he was the archmaster of the bright arts. Eventually, Alexa fully recognized the need to establish a separate group to study these powers more thoroughly, with Balthazar taking a back seat, but he remained obstinate about the idea to keep these powers on the down low in case some kind of conspiratorial forces would get involved. After lots of strong arming and convincing, and the last resort of vague flirtations that she was in no way proud of, Alexa convinced Balthazar to let her open up an academy dedicated to the study of the bright arts, as long as it would have Balthazar's name attached to his work, in spite of his complete lack of involvement. As soon as Alexa convinced him to give the go-ahead, she promptly moved the operation across the country and made no attempt to keep in contact with Balthazar whatsoever. Upon hearing about the academy doing well on the news a few years later, Balthazar, embittered with virgin rage, tried to sue Alexa for using his writing for her own monetary gain and for keeping him out of the deal. He tried to argue that she had sexually manipulated him into signing the contracts and that he was entitled to at least be a shareholder in the endeavor, but none of this held up in the courts as everyone could easily see that Balthazar was an idiot who had signed off the rights to his brainchild in the vain hope of getting to touch a tit, and he mostly ended up bringing public shame on himself, which only made him even angrier. Feeling bad for him and attempting to relent, Alexa offered him a role as an academic consultant, since he wasn't interested in actually becoming a teacher or looking into any of the research which had long exceeded his understanding of his own creation. Balthazar took the agreement and settled for receiving meager gratuity checks each month while almost never actually involving himself in the slightest. He stepped onto the campus once, but upon realizing that he looked like a creepy old sex pervert on this campus full of young, attractive light novel characters, he ran away and never looked back. He's probably still alive or something, but no one really knows or cares. Anyway, here's how the Bright Arts work. First of all, the Bright Arts are all tied into manipulating three basic phylums of source energy, mana, magic, and metal, because Balthazar thought metal was cool as shit because it's cold and hard, just like his heart or whatever. These three work in sort of a rock-paper-scissors system when it comes to combating each other, except that in practice, metal will always trump both of the other two because of all the workarounds that Balthazar put in to make it so whoever mastered metal powers would be the strongest Bright Arts user, meaning that since mana trumps magic and magic doesn't actually trump metal, magic is basically useless in a fight. The irony in this is that the Bright Arts are not especially useful for combat scenarios in which they'd be pitted against one another, given that pretty much all of the Bright Arts technicians are on the same team, and since magic has by far the most practical everyday uses, it is the most popular of the three energies. 
mana energies are by and large incorporeal. A few of them, such as the beefsteak mana, are related to food and can be ingested, but most of them come from stuff like ghosts and poltergeists and a hundred other classifications of spirits that are basically indistinguishable in terms of what they provide the mana user, but nonetheless are detailed extensively in Balthazar's notes. Metal energies are derived from metal. This isn't fucking rocket science. Magical energy comes from smoking marijuana. Depending on the strain, it can have different effects on the final product of a spell, but most of these are cosmetic. For instance, purple haze might make a purple cloud of smoke come out or something. You can pretty much figure this stuff out intuitively. It's the kind of thing a stoner would come up with. I can only imagine this had to do with the guys who hung around Balthazar's house in high school because their own houses sucked and Balthazar was rich, so his house was big and full of cool shit. Balthazar never never had the balls to actually indulge in any mind-altering substances, but he would read the issues of high times that his stoner buddies left around his house and take inspiration from those. Assumably, since I haven't forgotten that Balthazar supposedly wrote all this shit in the 40s, there was some kind of magical force of destiny in the universe that time-traveled those magazines to his stoner friends. Look, I don't want to have to justify every stupid-ass plot hole in this story, so from now on, if anything seems fucky, just come up with an explanation for it and I grant your explanation canonicity. Seriously, I really don't care, it's whatever you want it to be, man. Anyways, mana energy is most often useful to Meisters, Mudbloods, and Moogles, who all practice furry class bright art spells. Meisters are known for their ability to draw in the souls of animals into their brains and then slowly go insane. Over the years of encroaching insanity, their features will become more and more animal-like, but in random combinations, like having dog teeth in a duck bill or some fucked up shit like that. Where this becomes useful to themselves or to society is in that a super high-level Meister can smell every scent on Earth at at all times, and parse them all between his or her myriad phantom animal brains, thus allowing him to locate just about anything. It would be a really sick and useful power if the time between mastering it and going totally fucking insane to clawing your own eyeballs out and stuffing as many cotton balls into your skull as possible was more than about two weeks. There aren't a lot of people who try to become meisters, but most of the ones who do are foolhardy thrill seekers who think they're going to be the one to do it right, and that everyone else is just fucking up somehow even though it literally says in Balthazar's notes that Meisters are all insane people who will become tortured to the point of suicide by their powers because he thought that sounded edgy and cool. Mudbloods are primarily known for using the beefsteak mana, which often puts them on the fast track to dangerous obesity and type 2 diabetes or heart failure. Basically, they eat as much beefsteak as possible over the course of years, building up mana deposits in their intestines along the way, until one day they reach enough mana to be able to touch ghosts, at which point each each one has to convince a ghost to have sex with them in order to open their mana channels and push their powers over the edge. This is not as easy as you might think. There aren't a lot of ghosts who want to have sex with someone who's eaten beefsteak almost exclusively for years. Most ghosts have standards, though if the mudblood can find a ghost whose spirit is trapped on earth by their sexual regrets, then they might have better odds. There is a good chance that this sexual experience will not actually allow the ghost to pass on, however, and will usually leave them even more depressed than they were previously. Moogles are the little furry creatures from the Final Fantasy series that are super adorable, and Crystal Chronicles lets you spray paint their fur, which seems vaguely inhumane and bizarre, but I guess they're sentient and okay with it, so who am I to judge? If you want to understand Moogles more, I would recommend playing those games, as there's more to them than I have time to get into here. Suffice it to say, they are big fans of both beefsteak and ghosts. However, unlike Meisters or Mudbloods, Moogles are able to tap into metal and magical energy. They're just kinda like really into beefsteak and ghosts, so they don't end up using a lot of metal or magical arts in the long run. Metal energies are derived from rubbing metals. For the most part, this amounts to carrying some neat looking coins in your pocket made of various metals which you rub your fingers on and feel like a cool guy. But there is no question in my mind that Balthazar had something more akin to a sexual relationship with the elements. Not to say that he ever rubbed metal on his nuts, or that anything in his notes specifies the idea of doing so, but I know he must have been imagining hot girls rubbing themselves naked against hunks of metal when he came up with the phrasing of rubbing metal. Trust me on this one, I know this guy. Metal energies have a massive number of uses in terms of physical attack spells, but since most of them are meant to counterbalance other spells from Bright Arts users, they aren't really used all that much. Most Bright Arts users keep some metal powers in their back pockets and use them on occasion for random stuff, but if anyone would start to get way into them, it would just look suspicious, and they'd probably be questioned for their intentions. Magical energies basically do everything else. Bright Arts can do a whole lot of things, and I thought it'd be hilarious to go into extensive detail about all of it, but frankly, I'm already bored of this idea. 
idea. I forgot that I actually don't give a shit about extensively detailed power and magic systems the way that others do, and I usually just forget about how they work immediately after learning them. I'd rather get back to making up stupid characters with goofy names, so I apologize to anyone who is gearing up for a long and detailed magical system parody thing. Just go read Fate Stay Night and pretend it's ironic, it won't be hard. Also, I'm sick of this entire school conceit. I thought it would be a good way to burn through like 20,000 words, but I feel like I've more or less exhausted the joke at this point, and nothing else I could think of is going to top what I've already written, so let's just get this thing over with. If you want to fill in the rest of the lore, you be my guest. Anyways, moving along. Chapter 21. Writing this light novel is a terrible idea right now. I don't know why I impulsively promised to produce this in the week between episodes of the Aeromanga Sensei Every Week podcast. I think some part of me honestly believed I could do it in one day like the characters in the show, even though, as stated earlier, my typing speed alone would prevent that from being possible. Even doing it in a week would be considered an impressive feat by most, and I'm trying to do it while juggling six or so weekly podcasts, a ton of new shit that I have to do now that I've reformatted my Patreon, cleaning up the house so that it'll be presentable to renters, figuring out where the fuck I'm moving because I want to move into an RV, and even looking at those involves driving absurd distances to the few dealerships that have jack shit, and still managing to produce the cavalcade of vlogs and editorial videos that my entire career is based around. This was quite possibly the actual worst possible time that I could have promised to write a light novel in under a week. In fact, right now, my actual everyday personal life is probably more interesting than any kind of fictional story that I could come up with. I'm practically living a fantasy-slash-nightmare life. I just dropped a mini-album of me rapping over anime songs earlier tonight, apropos of nothing. Literally no one was asking for that, and barely anyone seems to care now that it exists. But for some reason, I saw fit to put that on my plate along with everything else. And now I'm just trying to get this thing written before the weekend because I'd like it if I also had the audiobook version completed by the time the next Aeromanga Sensei podcast comes out. And this will probably be a three or more hour audiobook, mind you, which will take three times that long to edit. I sincerely think that I may have actually lost or broken my mind, and that there may not be any recourse anymore. I am just a human machine built for content generation. I am Digibro. Who the fuck is Conrad? Chapter 22. If two lollies are making out in the woods, and no one's around to film it, will I still get a boner? Chapter 23. Dayglo Fandango was sitting around wasted off of his ass, wishing that he wasn't because he was also hungry and there was no food in the house, but he wasn't sober enough to drive, so he was basically trapped. All there was to drink was more beer, and he was seriously thirsty, but he didn't want to crack into his last coffee can because he'd already been driving right up to the brink of anxiety tonight, and he was almost certain that it would tip him over the edge. He'd already had one too many cigarettes, and knew that one more would send him spinning into a crushing headache, which he couldn't take medication for because, again, he was drunk. He'd perfectly locked himself into a mode of discomfort, and the few options available to do something about it would almost certainly just make it worse. And so, he plugged away at his writing project, trying his best to put the niggling thirst for caffeine at the back of his mind, and to focus on working for long enough of a straight session that perhaps he'd work right through the rest of his insobriety and be ready to drive by the time he stopped typing. Each time he needed to stop to think of the next thing to write, though, his brain would contort painfully, trying to work through the alcoholic haze, and he'd continue writing vaguely ashamed. This is the true story of my actual life. This is me right now. This is the part I'm actually drunk for. All that other shit was stone sober. Chapter 24. Authors will often state that each character they write contains a part of themselves. What they don't often corroborate is that each of their characters is, in its entirety, a part of them. As in, there is nothing more to the characters than that. In fact, it's a huge undiagnosed problem in storytelling. So many authors try to write characters who are not them, and they can't because it's impossible, and the audience can tell immediately. If an author tries to write, say, a scientist, or an intellectual, or a philosopher, or what have you, but the author themselves is none of those things and doesn't understand how they think or talk, then it's going to be blatantly obvious. So often authors will attempt to write a character smarter than themselves, but how can they? If they don't have the knowledge, then how can they put it into the character's mouth? How can they predict how someone smarter than themselves will act? Really, the upper limit of a character's intelligence is always going to be the author's own intelligence, which is probably why most light novel characters are total morons. Any character is going to be based on what information the author has and their understanding of that information. If I write a girl character, then she will be based on my knowledge and opinions of what a girl is and on the knowledge I've gained from girls talking about themselves and reinterpreted, by which I mean necessarily reinterpreted as I am not speaking from their mouths or from a greater pop cultural knowledge pool about girls which I am reinterpreting. 
In many cases, a facsimile of a girl may be exactly how the audience anticipates a girl to be. Even girls may think that I know how to write girls. This is only because my data and theirs have been interpreted similarly, but I have not injected the character with any data that I do not have. I have not stepped outside of myself and become a girl. I have just used the girl that exists inside of me to inform the character. After all, there is no one without some girl inside of them, or some boy, or anything, and everything else they've ever conceived of. Why am I talking about this? Chapter 25. All I really want is to have a light novel that's full of as many cute girls as it can be full of, but I have no earthly idea what I want them to be doing. My mind immediately jumps to sexual things only because I am uncreative, but I know that I'd enjoy watching them in whatever random daily life scenarios they'd be in. I don't even really care, I just want to live in an aesthetic existence. I just want to see the right people in the right place doing the right thing to suit whatever mood I happen to be in at the moment. I feel like I'm constantly waiting for the world to generate an aesthetic moment, or a series of such which I understand in a deep recess of my mind, and yet am totally incapable of producing. I'll know it when I see it, but I'm not even sure I can describe it, and there's no shortage of the like. For instance, I can remember one time that I read on Anime Critique's blog about his idea of having a waifu harem. He detailed extensively not only the nature of his waifus, but how he imagined their living situations and interactions with one another in the gigantic Japanese-style manner in which they all lived. He detailed what role each would serve in the household and how all of it would function, and it was so vastly more interesting than any description of just how cool it would be to fuck a bunch of hot anime girls that it instilled in me an intense desire to imagine something similar. I don't know if it's that I'm uncreative or that I lack this particular brand of creativity which Anime Critique had, but I could never actually imagine a scenario like the one he described. I could never rationalize my waifu choices on any kind of deeper level, nor imagine what my life would be with them outside of the realm of sexuality. I don't know why I'm lacking in these abilities to relate my aesthetic interests with my personal creativity. If someone wrote a story wherein a harem of characters whom I loved in the way that I love my own waifus were living in a Japanese style manner and all had these different roles, then I would probably think it was the coolest thing ever and be satisfied in such a way that I don't have to keep thinking about it and trying to force myself to make my own version of it. But since this is only in my head and is so poorly understood by me that I don't even know how to describe it well, I don't know if it can ever happen. The only way it could would be for someone else to share my aesthetic sensibility, as Anime Critique did in this specific instance, and then for that person to also happen to be an anime creator of some kind, or to work in a medium which also reaches me aesthetically. And even then, there are so many layers to aesthetic that it's almost impossible to align all of the planets just right. Cabinary of the Iron Fortress had character designs, an art style, a soundtrack, and a sense of action which all spoke to me deeply, but it also had zombies and steampunk trains and a feudal Japan era theme, and I didn't care about any of that. If I could just get K-On with the color palette of Ponyo, or better yet, just get a season of Tamako Market which looks exactly like the first, but this time tells a story more focused on exploring the lives of its town's residents, then I'd be golden. But this is all diving dangerously close to the realm of anime analysis, and this is supposed to be a light novel, so let's move on. Chapter 26. I have a dream of a perfect woman, and I'm never going to find her, so I'm never going to feel totally right in the head. I've met men who are close to being her, but are not women. I've met women who share half of her traits, but have another half that just don't mesh with me the same way. I know that I could live a long, full, and happy life with even 70% of the girl that I'm looking for, and yet the sensation that there should be, that there statistically is probably a 100% version out there somewhere, will haunt me to the grave, and I know it. I will always wonder what could have been if this girl who's just shy of perfect was also a smoker, or if she really didn't care for Disney, or if she liked Hitamari sketch as much as I did or whatever minor tweak could be made to bring her to the perfection that I just can't bring out of her. And considering my pool of samples being outright minuscule and the chances of me even finding a girl in the ballpark of the perfect girl is intimidatingly slim, at best I see myself bouncing between experiences with girls who slot in just a few of the blanks and either learning to appreciate all of their incongruencies with my platonic ideal of them or simply dealing with those for as long as I can until the relationship becomes dysfunctional. Which is all fine and well enough, the only thing to fear is reaching that point and failing to do anything about it. But in the meantime, this journey is all about the looming sense of emptiness that comes from a thousand interactions with the one whom I know in my heart of hearts is not Mrs. Wright, at least not now. But this is true of virtually every aspect of my life anyway, so it's nothing new. Say la vie. Chapter 27. If I can crank out 2,000 words an hour, then I can wrap this son of a bitch up in about 13 hours. I say we go for it, baby. I've got a desk drawer overflowing with old notebooks containing story concepts that I came up with over the years, and I'm sure I can pull some ideas from those to at least describe the potential plot of would-be light novels. I've got some Japanese coffee, and about three more hours of daylight if I need to go out for food again. 
It's weirdly cold in my room for a sunny day in May, so I might have to throw on the old robe. Just bought a pack of Camel Crush Greens because all the other cigarettes I have are a bit too harsh for my taste, since they're all specialty shit and I'm just trying to smoke for work's sake. It just turned 6.01pm precisely, so if I have a quick smoke, I can probably come back and gin up 2k words before the hour is up. Let's give it a fucking whirl. Chapter 28. One time I had this idea for a story called Chip. The basic premise is that the main character is this 10-year-old girl, at least at the start, whose mother is the president of an enormous interplanetary business, living in a Trump Tower-esque giant building in a sci-fi metropolis on some distant planet. She is a by and large unassuming young lady, living a comparatively normal life and being fairly average in terms of intelligence. She has a younger sister, however, who is a budding prodigy and stunningly beautiful, obviously destined to grow into a powerful and attractive woman. For whatever reason I don't remember, her father starts to go insane and becomes obsessed with the younger sister, and then one day ends up raping and murdering her before jumping through one of the windows of the tower and plummeting to his death. The mother is so shaken by the loss of her precious daughter that she can no longer bear the thought of having children at all, and becomes a cutthroat businesswoman obsessed with conquest in the bottom line. Now viewing her remaining daughter as dead weight, she decides to use her as a bargaining chip, to marry her off to whatever other rich business person is looking for a dangerously young wife as a sign of goodwill in their business interactions, kind of like how princesses were back in ancient times. And so, our main character, who herself is so lost in the shuffle of all the crazy shit going on that she basically just goes along with whatever's happening, is sold off to be the wife of yet another powerful businesswoman, this one younger than her mother and more on the come up, but apparently with an interest in young girls. So she ends up going to live with her new wife, but whereas her parents had always taken a hands-off approach with her because they simply saw her as untalented and unworthy of spending time on, the other business lady is intently interested on raising her, almost as if she was her own daughter, and takes her along as she travels the galaxy making business deals on all kinds of other planets while teaching her about business in terms that she can understand. Basically, she becomes this woman's protege, which is perhaps what the woman wanted most in the first place, but she does also show loving affection towards her and they share a bed, Though it's only after a few years and after the younger girl has grown accustomed to being with her that their relationship takes on a sexual side. I've always had an interest in this sort of character who is at once philanthropic but only in a way which is couched in their personal interests and tastes. Like, this woman clearly wants a lolly waifu and used the underhanded method of buying her companionship to get her, but then does everything in her power not only to make the girl's life better than what it was, but to outright raise her and shape her into a better functioning person. It rides all over a moral line. Even though her intentions are questionable at best, the results of her actions are almost unquestionably beneficial to this girl who probably would have had a shit time otherwise. Over time, as the two grow closer to the point that they have a legitimate true love for one another, it becomes difficult to apply morality to any of it at all, and more to view it as a cosmic consequence. The story would take place over decades of the young girl's life, as she becomes more worldly and skilled in business, and eventually makes a name for herself outside of the shadow of either her mother or wife. While she will never be an industry titan in the way that her mother was, she can nonetheless make a good life for herself and be successful in her own right as a human being, something which perhaps her real family felt they were above. I'm sure she'd eventually have run-ins with her mother again down the line and to reach some kind of self-actualization through their encounter, and maybe eventually her and the wife would start their own family or something, I don't know, I never thought that far into the story. It's more that I had an interest in this aesthetic idea of taking the old feudal idea of marrying a young girl into a prestigious family and setting it in space and with lesbians and having it start from a really dark and violent place but eventually grow into something really positive and uplifting. I don't know, maybe it'd be a cool story, maybe it wouldn't. It's really just the concept at this stage and the proof would have to be in the pudding. Proof that there is an actually resonant story in there outside of the fetishistic premise which obviously inspired it. Maybe you want to take a crack at writing it. Be my guest. God knows I'm never going to get around to it. I can only write unhinged meta novels. Chapter 29. Another story that I wanted to write for a long time is a magical girl story called Wish Giver Salome about a little boy who becomes a magical girl. It's a trans story, ultimately, but I feel it's important to say that Salome is indeed a little boy at the start of the story. I feel like we get into this weird conversation when it comes to pronouns, like when someone realizes that they're not the gender they were born, it both is immediate that they be referred to differently and that what they have been all this time is invalidated. 
But I don't think that kind of thing happens at the flip of a switch. It's a transition. If gender is performative, and if so much of it is socially constructed, then it's not as though the social programming which has been fed to you based on your sex your entire life just suddenly has no effect as soon as you realize that you don't agree with it. It's complex, and there's reasons we use words like transition in the process. None of this is to say that if someone tells you, hey, start calling me a girl now, then you shouldn't. What I'm referring to more is how this gets applied to trans characters. To me, the moment that a trans character should be referred to by a gender is the moment that they themselves see themselves as that gender and want to be referred to as it. At the beginning of Wishgiver Salome, Salome identifies as a boy who happens to enjoy dressing as a girl. Later into the story, he will start to consider the idea of himself as a girl and eventually will transition into becoming one and to start to be referred to as such. Even at an early point in the story, Salome is by and large identified as female, but since he isn't actually sure yet himself if he will ultimately make the transition, I feel it better represents the conflict to not insist that I know better just because I know that he will transition in the long run. Does that make sense? I just feel weird about saying that this kid is a girl when he doesn't even fully know that himself yet. Anyways, the point of the story is that he's a little boy who dresses as a little girl and is treated as such by the society around him, and one day he gains the powers of a magical girl from Nyarlathotep. We'll get into that later. One of the things I wanted to portray with this story is a world in which Salome is already accepted for who he is from the start of the story. As opposed to making something that relates more to the present experience of trans people in society, I wanted to represent an idealized society in which progress has already been made towards accepting trans people altogether. My inspiration for this was to show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, which presents a society that is already past most of the social problems that we face in our own world, and therefore allows us to view a more functional society from the outside that we can possibly take inspiration from. The point wouldn't be so much to create a story catering to the interest of trans people themselves or to be relatable for them, but more so to normalize normalize the idea of a trans person to the audience themselves. See, like most Magical Girl series, Wishgiver Salome would be written for children. It would be a story that anyone of any age could pick up and read and to learn their behavior from. So what I want kids to see is a world in which being a trans person is already normal and cool, and to see a heroic trans character and to think that trans people are not only okay but admirable. Initially, I was going to have the story be in first person, with Salome as the narrator, but I never had much of an idea of what Salome was like as a character, outside of being a really kind-hearted person whom everyone in the community loves, and who goes around saving people as a magical girl. So instead, I introduced the idea of a narrator character, a young girl who starts the story when she moves into the town that Salome lives in and goes to his school. This character might not immediately understand Salome and why everyone thinks it's okay to have him in, say, the girls' changing rooms at school, but would have it explained to her by others. Growing suspicious, she would keep an eye on Salome and end up witnessing his magical girl transformation and see him fighting some kind of monster, and inspired by his courage, she would rush out of cover to help him and end up getting wrapped up in the narrative. I never totally decided on what Salome is fighting or the nature of the social problems that he's trying to resolve by doing so, but he would be getting his missions from Nyarlathotep, one of the Lovecraftian mythos gods because I am obsessed with Lovecraft. Nyarlathotep would operate out of the back room of a local FYE store, because in my town we used to have this gigantic FYE which had a special section in the back for used stuff, and I always loved the idea of a store that has this tucked away section that most people wouldn't bother venturing into. Nyarlathotep would spend all of his time sitting back there watching movies, since the original short story that he comes from involves the idea of him showing movies to people to break their minds, and Salome would meet him there to learn about magical girl missions. Because it's a story that I came up with, and this is always the case in my stories, we would follow Salome over the course of his teenage years, as he gradually starts to feel more and more that maybe he does want to transition into being a woman, while also having a deepening relationship with the narrator girl. Eventually, he would get a full-on sex change and become the cutest girl ever, and they'd live happily ever after, and I don't know, I just want this thing to happen. Sick, that's 2,000 words, and I still have 12 minutes to spare in this hour. Unfortunately, I just exhausted the two story concepts I was most interested in discussing, so now I'm shit out of ideas again. Curse me for having trained so long on consolidating my ideas into easily explainable chunks instead of becoming an academic who learns how to bullshit their papers out to Wagnerian lengths as possible. Chapter 30. Another concept I had was for a series of erotic fantasy shorts called Until We Resurface. Basically, I'd have this fully realized fantasy world wherein all of the stories take place, but I would focus on little vignette stories of different relationships or crazy-ass sex scenarios that go on in this world. 
The one I remember the most was about a village which is facing an underpopulation issue and concerns over the genetics of many of the villagers being too weak. So they gather the man and woman with the best genetics in the village and make them bear a son, and then for that son's entire life he ends up banging pretty much every available girl in the village across multiple generations, and basically lives his life as just a guy who has lots of sex with lots of different women. Pretty cool. I think I had another idea involving the queen of some country being a lesbian, but that could literally describe 80% of all the stories I've ever come up with, so not helpful. Chapter 31. I keep trying to think of like an actual light novel plot that I could try to write, but the idea of actually writing a generic light novel is so boring to me that it would actually be more difficult than struggling to come up with something that interests me enough to write about. Chapter 32. People often ask me if I think I'll ever run out of things to write or talk about. Sometimes I consider this possibility simply because I produce content at a faster rate sometimes than I really have the ability to marinate on ideas. After all, if you only ever make content about how your day went, then eventually your content is all going to be about how your day was spent making content about how your day went. It's a snake that eats its own tail. So in that sense, I worry about running out of things to talk about if I keep trying to talk every five minutes. But if I have an hour or two to think, then no, I don't think I can really run out of ideas. And I can tell you now that I have more than enough reason to believe that there is precedent to my level of output. Lately I've been reading the first omnibus volume of Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy. Osamu Tezuka literally wrote over a thousand manga. Many of those were one chapter shorts, sure, but some of those were in the range of 20 plus volumes, spanning like 16 years of publication. And it's not as though any of his stories was simplistic and straightforward. Each of them was packed to the fucking gills with ideas. Each chapter of Astro Boy is a total roller coaster ride through every little thing that popped into Tezuka's mind while writing it. Sometimes literally random shit would fly into the panels just because it was something he thought of and worked in. The man never went a second of his life not coming up with ideas, and since he spent as much time drawing, all of those ideas made it to paper. Were a lot of them repetitive and unoriginal? Undoubtedly. Most ideas are. But no one can deny the man's breadth of ideas and content production. So am I really stacking myself up against a 1 in 100 million talent like Osamu Tezuka? Well, only time will tell if I can keep up with him, but why not? I can't claim that any of my ideas are or ever will be as good as his, and certainly not that any of them will come even close to suggesting that they may rival the cultural impact of his work. Few people will ever have ideas which do that. But am I as much a wellspring of ideas as that guy? Maybe. My point is that it's a type of person who exists. He isn't the only one, and in fact in the YouTube era I can point to a number of creators who don't seem to have any interest in anything other than content creation. Some like myself who almost can't seem to function in any other way but to be creating things. And if that type of person is real, then I am most certainly one of them. Chapter 33 What's really fucking with me now is that it feels like I've been writing for 15 minutes, but it's actually been an hour, and my body seems to detect this a hell of a lot more than my mind does. I've been listening to lo-fi hip-hop radio, courtesy of the Chilled Cow channel, which is perfect background music to do just about anything to, but it also provides no sensation of time past. It's not my music, so I don't know the length of each song by heart as I would with my music, nor can I intuitively detect the lengths of songs since they all mix and blend into one another almost seamlessly. Or at least they all sound so alike that how do I know when they change? My eyes are starting to detest this screen, which is getting brighter by the moment as the sun finishes setting, and I fear standing up to turn on the light as it might inspire me to drift away from the computer and go to fulfill some other desire, like to sate my mounting hunger, or to have yet another smoke even though it hasn't been long enough since the last one and when I smoke too frequently my brain gets fogged up and I have a migraine, which is not conducive to anything. I can already tell which parts of my body will be aching after 13 hours in this chair, and I can smell the level of manic depravity I'll be operating on by as early as 3 a.m especially because at around 11 I have to record a podcast which, while only 45 minutes long, does traditionally involve drinking beer, and by the end of that, who knows what mind state I'll be in. I'm almost certain that by that time I'll have exhausted my sober creativity and be aching for a change in mind state, but I'm not sure that alcohol will be as advantageous as coffee might be. For that matter, I'm tempted to pick up a whole bunch of Japanese canned coffees and drinking one every time my brain even suggests that it's starting to get tired over the course of the night. Maybe if I spike my Christ consciousness enough, I can be elevated to a higher plane, like Fry in that one episode of Futurama. In any case, I'd rather be prepared for that possibility than not. I definitely don't want to wait until all the stores are closed before I decide that I need a ton of extra drinks to make it through the night. But then I also don't want to cut a potential 30 or 40 minutes out of one of these hours by going all the way to the Asian grocery store. I'd rather just skate up to the Wawa for anything that I need and try to make do with what I have. 
In addition to the one UCC coffee and half a case of Takati I've got on deck, I could pick up a fresh iced coffee from Wawa, which will last me hours regardless, a one-off beer can to drink through the whole show, and I can skate over to Wendy's or something to pick up food. I won't bother getting something for later, because by 2 or 3 a.m., I will be absolutely dying for an excuse to get up and go somewhere again, and the taste of whatever I get will be inconsequential to me. So I guess that's the plan. It's 7.22 and I've got less than a thousand words to go for this hour, so if I'm really quick on my feet then I should be able to meet the deadline and still have some time to go for chicken nuggets and still have time to stuff some chicken nuggets in my face when 8 rolls around. Let's go for it. Chapter 34 let me describe to you the six adorable blue-haired devil girls who make up the cast of a show I just invented called Sister Six, or Sixters if you're an asshole. The eldest sister is Brandy's Blue, a 29-year-old who could pass for 12, who is deeply concerned about her lack of marriage ability as she rapidly approaches 30. Brandy's is obsessed with sweets, but she also likes sounding smart, so oftentimes she will paradoxically explain some kind of deep or meaningful lesson to one of her sisters while sucking on a lollipop or blowing bubblegum and playing with it or something. In truth, she really is extremely intelligent and successful in her job as a physicist, but everyone has a difficult time taking her seriously because of her childish interests and attitude. When she's not at work, she spends most of her time playing video games at home. She has tried online dating, but her accounts keep getting deleted because they think she's underage. In contrast with Brandy's, her younger sister Zaffer, age 26, is the one who everyone actually thinks of as the eldest sister. She wears glasses, has an enormous rack, and dresses in long skirts with well-coordinated blouses and jackets, giving her an Onechan aura. Compared to the rest of the sisters, she is exceptional at domestic living, and because she reads books all the time, everyone generally assumes her to be the smart one, even though she is mostly just good at giving standard motherly advice and isn't particularly book smart in the way that her older sister is. Most of the books that she reads are contemporary romance novels. It is thought by those who recognize this that the only reason she hasn't gotten married yet in spite of men constantly flocking to her side is that she's still waiting for Prince Charming to come riding in on a white horse. Younger than Zaffir at age 21 is Ultramarine, who lived up to her name by joining the Marines, thanks to being a hardcore military otaku. Ultramarine is exceedingly high energy, and now that she's of legal drinking age, she's, she seriously can't stop drinking and partying whenever she's on leave. She continually goes on rants about her problems with men, but anyone listening can easily tell that she's never actually dated anyone before, most likely because she always gets too drunk to actually make it home with anyone who she tries to hook up with. She is flippantly violent, getting into fights at the first insult and often threatening others with her open carry firearm, though she has never actually shot anyone. When she's not drinking and going ape shit, she likes to hang out and play video games with Brandies, though the older sister will let her win one out of every four games or so just to keep her from breaking the controller. At age 16 is Viridian, a perfectly average high school girl, at least by day, and in the image that she likes to convey to the outside world. In reality, she is a hardcore Yuri fetish artist who spends all of her nights in a tracksuit and glasses with her nose to the tablet, penning some of the most niche interest doujinshi on the market. Oftentimes, her readers will complain that her artwork is so beautiful they wish she'd write some more normal or general interest stories, since some of the stuff that she puts into her stories makes them uncomfortable. But Viridian will quote tweet people like this with the response of a hand-drawn giant middle finger, and her social media presence is overall hyper-abrasive. None of this is evident in her offline persona, however, where she tries to be the spitting image of normalcy and togetherness, but bits of her real self bleed through whenever she catches sight of two cute girls together. Lastly, there's the twins, Iris and Majorelle, age 10. These two precocious kids are nigh inseparable and often wear matching clothes to look as similar as possible. They have a gimmick where they go around asking people if they can differentiate the shades of blue in their hair. If they can, then they are given a crayon-drawn business card informing them of how to contact the Blue Sisters Detective Agency if they ever have any problems in need of solving. If they can't, then they are given a hand-drawn colorblindness test. These girls come off as mysterious to others who can't understand the sort of special style of communication that they have between themselves, and even their sisters aren't really sure what they're up to most of the time. Given that all of these girls are daughters of the Demon King, who left their mother to raise them while he went back to rule over Hell, each of them is capable of sprouting devil horns from their head and summoning the power of blue flames to incinerate anything around them, or in Zaffir's case, to cook food and do regular household chores. 
Their abilities to manipulate flame are proportional to their ages, so the twins don't have enough power to cause any real harm, which is in everyone's best interest. The story takes place during a period when their human mother has been hospitalized, so they often pay visits to her whenever we want to make a kind of melancholy feelsy scene in the story. And that pretty much sums it up. I legitimately created the entire scenario for a run-of-the-mill slice-of-life show about cute monster girl sisters living their day-to-day -day lives. I bet you're thinking, holy shit, I would actually watch that show. I bet you already know which one's your favorite character, or are thinking of how you hope there's an adorable episode that's just about the twins trying to actually do detective work. Well, my friends, I don't blame you. This show sounds fucking great. And that's why, if you can help me to raise $15 million on Kickstarter, I think we can greenlight this show to a mainstream studio. I'm thinking JC Staff or maybe even Dean. Who's on board? Who's got money to throw around? What's that you say? I should just write an entire actual light novel about those characters, get an artist attached, and get that story popular enough that it gets optioned for adaptation? Hmm. Well, that's a good point. Unfortunately, I don't have time for that. Thinking up actual storylines is a lot harder than just slapping together character bios out of random tropes. I'd have to have actual talent to come up with an engaging story, or at least I'd have to be able to pay a decent artist to sell my book without it. Honestly though, I'd rather let someone else do all the work. I'm in the business of watching and talking about anime, not creating it. And with that, I think it's time to move on. Chapter 35. You know, the sad thing about this book is that if I edited it down to take out all the really stupid meta stuff and the parts where I'm just talking to the audience directly, it could probably be formatted into a halfway decent comedy book. Or at least it could even just be a collection of neat little story pitches. Parts of this are legitimately funny, but it's all bogged down in this extra filler bullshit that I'm just including because I have to meet this incredibly tight deadline. And it's not like I have a choice here. Like, believe me, if there was the option to make this something good, then I would take it. But I just literally don't have time. Maybe next time I try to write a light novel, I won't do it under the most retarded circumstances imaginable. Maybe. Chapter 36. In the year 2025, Professor Myballs Itch creates the world's first ever peripheral device which allows the human consciousness to fully interface with the digital world, to access the infinitely connected wealth of human intelligence that is the internet in full range and in full motion, as if you were actually there for yourself, experiencing it firsthand, and your real body didn't even exist. Immediately, this technology was put to the most rational and beneficial use to society, playing video games with your friends. Within 400 hours of the technology becoming available to the public, literally everyone who could afford it jumped into the virtual world and then immediately used the real body controls interface to commit real world suicide. In minutes, the entire richest 5% of the Earth's population completely vanished into the server farm that they'd built up on the moon, where none of the filthy untouchables that they left behind could accidentally shut them off or something. With corporate interests completely out of the picture, and no one left who was smart enough to figure out how to reinstate what they had had before because they couldn't and afford that sick, nasty Harvard education, the entire planet went back to tribal societies, and it became something like a libertarian utopia and everybody loved it. Meanwhile, back inside the video game world, everyone was just making out and fucking constantly. All of their virtual avatars were so attractive, and there was literally no potential downsides to open sexual relationships in this world, that the prospect of doing anything other than fucking just seemed like a bafflingly retarded idea. Most of the people there forgot whoever they'd been before and didn't give a shit about anything. A couple of edgy 14 year olds who'd never been interested in sex before would go on quests and fight monsters and stuff for a while, but eventually they'd end up encountering someone of the opposite sex doing the same thing, and upon realizing that they had a shared interest, they would immediately start fucking constantly and never actually participate in their former shared interest again, because literally who cares about that shit. Of course, little did they all know that all of this was really a gigantic conspiracy by the original programmer to trap them all inside the game so that he'd have all the richest, most beautiful people in the world under his control for him to rape freely. In the end, that didn't really matter though, because these people wanted to be trapped here and they wanted to fuck, so really he was just providing a service in the end. And since his consciousness was transferred right when he was in the middle of dying of a supernatural non-specific illness, which somehow corrupted the data files of his consciousness, he basically lived for about a week, got one nut, and then disappeared into the waste code of the game forever, never to be remembered. And that boy? was Sword Art Online. See, you knew it would all come together in the end. Chapter 37. What the hell, I didn't even wring a thousand words out of the entire trapped in a video game cliche? What kind of light novel author am I? Am I gonna have to throw in an entire separate isekai section just to make up for this? I didn't even leave any room to develop a douchebag overpowered protagonist. This is really going off the rails in all the wrong directions. Poor performance on my part, and I'm definitely gonna have to make up for it. 
Chapter 38. This is the halfway point. I can't believe this is only the halfway point. Please kill me. I'm just gonna start crowdsourcing ideas on Twitter. Chapter 39. I can't believe my fucking little sister is a swamp monster. That's fucking hot. Chapter 1. My little sister is a fucking swamp monster. My little sister is a fucking swamp monster! I can't fucking believe it! What are the odds that my incredibly specific fetish for gelatinous blobs of disgusting social runoff would happen to also be combined with my little sister, whom I've wanted to fuck basically since the day she was born? One day I was just jacking off outside my sister's bedroom while listening to her talk on the phone to one of her stupid ass friends, when all of a sudden, BAM! She yells, BY THE WAY, I'M A SWAMP MONSTER IN SECRET, DON'T TELL MY RETARDED BROTHER! And I was like, OH SHIT NIGGA NO! away and then i caught the scent the scent of rancid bubbling green liquid which was slowly seeping under the door at that moment my dick couldn't take it anymore i was gonna fuck that swamp sister whether she liked it or not i powered right through the lock on her door handle and flung the door open in one swift motion hand and dick outstretched in salute and screamed bitch i know you know i gotta get in that sick ass swamp pussy and she said i know you playing nisama of course i was yelling that shit so you could hear me and i said bitch and then i fucked her in every part of her body because she's made of swamp and that's cool as shit and then my cum was floating around in her afterwards and stuff you get it you've read these kinds of porn before you're hip you're young you're down to clown on some monster girls and some out there sex shit you ain't no fucking square you don't even bat an eye at lollies getting railed by horses or giant godzillas fucking bigger giantess godzillas or none of that shit you know what the fuck is up you don't play hell yeah what's really good motherfucker chapter two Oh shit, my swamp sister isn't goopy enough. Oh shit, my swamp sister isn't goopy enough. After six weeks of almost constant fucking, I started to notice that my sister's swampy consistency was growing a little bit more stale and hard. Yo, bitch, what the deal? Your pussy dry like British comedy. Well, shit, nigga, I ain't been to the swamp in like a minute cause yo ass always trying to get a nut on motherfucking day. I already failed out of high school cause I ain't never show up and now you the one complaining shit. Well, damn, bitch, that's all you had to say. Get your fucking purse together and let's gibbity get to the swiggity swamp, young feel me? Yeah, all right, let me hit up all my whole friends though cause they won't stop trying to call me trying to hang out and shit and I'm like, bitch, I got a man now. I ain't got time for all that. But I know you want to see they big ass is busting up out of their slut ass bikinis anyway so i'ma let them come whatever bitch and so my sister and i went to the swamp with all of her dumbass skank friends and they all wore bathing suits and complained about how humid it was as sweat trickled between their giant tits and tight perfect thighs at first I wasn't even really looking all that much, but then they all wanted to swim in the swamp, and once I saw them each all covered in swamp goo, it started getting harder and harder to hide how much harder and harder it was getting. Finally, I got into the swamp myself, and before I knew it, I started feeling a tugging at my pants. I wasn't sure what was going on, so I ducked down into the swamp, as the front of my pants pulled itself open and my dick popped out. That's when I realized. It was my motherfucking sister. She was blended in with the swamp, and she was giving me a disguised swamp ghost blowjob. As I sat there fucking my little sister and watching all these big titty hoes cover themselves in swamp goo, I realized that this was always going to go down as the best day of my life. So I promptly took up my sister in my arms, pressed my face deep into her viscous chest, and drowned myself to death. Chapter 40. Holy shit, I was reaching into that aforementioned drawer in my desk where I have all my old story concepts, and I came across what is legitimately one of the coolest story concepts I ever came up with, which I completely forgot about. I wrote it when I was in college psychology class and found out that there's a book with a numbered list of psychological disorders. The story begins when a giant burst of mysterious power washes over the world. It affects only people with certain genetic properties and gives them powers based on their personalities. The main character, Six Connor, is a psychologist who gains a power that allows her to see colored numbers on the chest of each person that she encounters, which indicates which psychological abnormalities they suffer from and has an asterisk nest to it if they're someone with special powers. Six's girlfriend and her girlfriend's brother also gain special powers, but all of them are different, so Six decides that she wants to travel the world in search of other people with powers in order to study them and potentially to offer them help in learning to understand and get a handle on their powers. They travel around in a bus full of equipment which is used to study and test the powers. According to my notes, the story is supposed to be structured like Pokemon. Also, the brother and sister are apparently named Bright and Shimmer, and this was before I ever watched any of My Little Pony. Nothing has ever changed about me. 
Anyways, this story premise is awesome and it basically writes itself. It could easily be made into a long running TV show with a standalone complex structure and it'd be dope as shit. Someone please offer me money to script this or at least hire someone to script this. Chapter 41. There is so much shit in this drawer, Jesus Christ. I just found a page of notes for that chip story I talked about earlier, which is literally a map of the entire story's universe, in the style of, like, the Mass Effect galaxy map. Except Mass Effect wasn't even out at the time, or at least I hadn't played it yet. Why do I even have all this information when I had so little of the actual story planned? Chapter 42. Okay, I just found this 8-panel comic in this drawer that I must have written at least 5 years ago, and I want to transcribe it here because I feel it's imperative to clarifying just how much nothing has ever fucking changed. It's all drawn with stick figures in my usual hyper-rough sketchy line style, so you're not missing much by not getting to see it. Panel 1 just reads, Embodiment of Scarlet Neat, Book 1, I am on my bed staring at Flander. Panel 2 has me facing the camera. It says, This is me. I am a neat. Panel 3 has me laying on a bed. It says, I am on a bed, staring at Flander. Panel 4 is a terrible attempt at drawing my Nendoroid of Flander Scarlet from Toho. It reads, Flander says hi. Panel 5 cuts back to me writing on a paper. It says, In between staring at Flander, I am drawing a comic. Poorly. Panel 6 is mostly text over a representation of the comic itself, with six panels filled in. It says, the comic is meant to be a constant stream of consciousness and totally postmodern. Panel 7 is just my face and the text, but because I hate everything I make, I'm already done with it. Panel 8 is just a distant shot of me lying in bed and it says, I'm glad I don't own a gun. Chapter 43. Okay, so I thought about doing a chapter of this where I parody the style of do da 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 or Bacano, but the truth is that most of the stories I tried to create in my late teens and early 20s were exactly that. I was totally obsessed with the idea of creating a city full of gangsters and kooky characters and violence and fun. If you've read or listened to the light novel that I wrote for NaNoWriMo 2010, then you are well aware of this, as Tales from the End of the World was pretty much a combination of Boogie Pop, Bacano, and Black Lagoon. However, much in the way that Duda Dada was like Bacano but different, I also had a story that was like Tales but different, in almost exactly the same way, most likely because the Duda Dada anime had come out at that point. I had several names for this story. One was Scar Mono, short for Scarlet Monochrome. One was Carnivus City Reds, named because the city the story takes place in is called Carnivus City. Generally, all the names revolved around the color red, because I was obsessed with it at the time. The notes describe it as a bleak and violent, yet heartwarming, yet crushing tale of everything. Yeah, that's not very helpful. The characters are described as follows. The Silent. A group of disenchanted youths who unemotionally lay waste to the city. They are utterly ruthless, ultra wildcard players. As an aside, I always imagined this as a group of teenagers who basically just drive around the city in a van throwing grenades and hitting people with bats and shit before vanishing out to wherever they hide. Moongrave the Unmoving. A sleeping beast. He is unstoppably powerful, but doesn't ever move for himself. He only moves for the hearts of others. Who moves him could be anyone. Wild card. I guess the idea with this guy is that some underpowered character would end up moving his heart and causing him to fight under their command. It would probably be someone with little at stake in the main conflict of the story, but who has some kind of oddly specific goal in the situation that just happens to cause them to run into the main players in some capacity. Never Summer Blackwind, a woman who was once an agent of justice but no longer knows what to believe in, started smoking to feel more gruff, slowly becomes villainous. I guess with this one I was going for someone who is an adult but kind of an idiot and is guided by their own derpy interpretation of the world to use their superpowers for random causes. I like that kind of character. Only Forewater, a sadistic, manipulative villain whose personal goal is to capture the souls of others through magic contract and raise a personal army. He will work hard for a soul. This guy sounds like he's obviously supposed to be the Isaiah of my story. Danger Wrong, a highly aggressive and cruel swordsman who is looking to escape his cursed existence by saving the lives of bad men. This actually sounds pretty cool. It's basically the plot of Blade of the Immortal, except that the character has to protect evil men instead of murdering a thousand of them. I dig it as a side character in a bigger story. Sever Bloodpool, a night terror of impressive power who sees herself as a savior of mankind with a hero complex. Very dangerous being. In retrospect, I have no idea what I was going for with this character. I was just really into the idea of the hero complex at the time. Klein Syringe, a white magician who was opposed to both Sever and Only, but doesn't believe in violence. Seems pretty straightforward. 
Zed Neverender, an undead shambling horror who's grown used to his immortal life, but wants to understand why he's alive. Okay, that sounds fun, a zombie on an existential journey. I like how I obviously just wanted to name a character after the Coheed and Cambria song Neverender, and then came up with an interpretation of that word for the character. Mouse Mikhail, an orphan girl with only half of a heart searching for a family to love her. She is absurdly powerful. This sounds like some interesting fairy tale melodrama, but I don't know why she's so strong, apparently. Blue Light! I'm not kidding, these are the names I came up with. A kind-hearted man who wants to peacefully turn people away from Only's influence. Sounds like a plot device character. Super Nothing! A self-depreciating mage with control over time and space, but so little confidence that he would commit suicide if left unattended. Lol. Sunny Darkscale, Super's friend and companion who watches to make sure that he keeps alive, is conversely cheerful and self-confident and strong in his own right. This combo sounds seriously do da 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 to me, like it reminds me of the Dollars crew. Dune Calamity, former boyfriend of one of the silent who had his throat slit and was left for dead. He still hopes to earn his old girlfriend's love back. This sounds like it'd be a fun character to write for, even if he's not terribly interesting compared to the others. Reverend, a churchman with obscure morals, simultaneously working for and against the Mafia, wants to stop the silent. Yeah, this just sounds like an excuse to have a morally dubious church in the story, because those are cool. Beatrice Golden, Reverend's young female attendant who makes it her holy mission to reform the city. Not a lot to go on there, but it sounds adorable. The Soul Network, the collective of people whose souls only has command over or owns. Self-explanatory. Livia Bowline, Only's slave girl and lover. Their relationship is a complex love-hate web between them. I guess this is what you get if Isaiah and that woman who he had as his assistant were actually into one another. I'm down for that, sounds fun to write. Deathly Prowler, Only's second in command, told to watch Livia who is the only person that only claims to worry him. Yeah, Isaiah ripoff just never ends. Only one person who he's actually concerned about as having a threat to his plans? Huh, that doesn't sound familiar. Sakura Peace Runner, the spirit guardian of the city who watches it from above, occasionally interferes to remind everyone who's in control. Yeah, I don't know, this sounds like a nightmare from a storytelling perspective, but I was way into the idea of having gods in my stories and for them to fuck around with the story, which would probably just piss most readers off. Balthazar and Korana Calamity. Jesus Christ, I really do reuse the same names all the time. Korana fights to preserve her ideal world for her and Balthazar down to an extremely calculated extreme. There's no mention of these two having any relationship to Dune Calamity, which really makes me wonder if I just didn't realize I'd already put a character with that last name into the story, or if they're supposed to be his parents. In any case, Korana sounds like a really fun character to write. Jag Tiger Panzergeist, a tank driver who will fuck with whatever tries to fuck with him. Yeah, I don't know, I just always like there to be a tank guy in my stories. And that's about it! Obviously there are some narrative threads just in those little bios which you can easily imagine building a story out of, but it's the actual doing of that where I tend to fall short. I'm sure there's more character bios for this story in some of my other notebooks, and there's a section where I just name all the different districts of Carnivus City and then even some of the roads, but that's all I've got to go on here, so let's move along. Chapter 44 What's really fucking with me right now is that when I'm stuck trying to think of ideas, I usually start looking around my room or thinking about other pop media stuff that I'm a fan of. This is all well and good when I'm writing analytical stuff or just fucking around. Looking through all these old notebooks, there are so many cases where I just wrote out lyrics to some song that I was a big fan of, obviously because I wanted to be writing something but didn't have any ideas, so I just wrote out some other thing to bide my time while I tried to think of something or otherwise get over my creative impulse. But in this case, I can't do that because I'm trying to create an original novel and I can't just literally start integrating other characters and shit into my story. I mean, you can see earlier where I tried to make parody versions of the songs that were popping into my head, but in those cases, it quickly became obviously retarded and I stopped. So this is getting really difficult. Chapter 45. I'm reading through what is probably the most interesting of all the notebooks I've ever kept. It's a slim one with a gray cover that I carried throughout my time in college, and the front of the book has an entire table of contents written on it in pen, which extends onto the back cover. 
Unlike most of my notebooks, which have text all over them in random places, often starting from both the front and back of each section, but with long swaths of unused pages in between, this one is straightforwardly run through in order and almost to completion. 99 pages are documented in the table of contents, but there seems to be more writing on some of the back pages, as well as a few bad attempts at drawing porn, which was probably what soured me to carrying the book around at some point, since I hated that I might accidentally flip to those pages. This book was created at a time when I was most taking myself seriously as someone trying to go for a career in writing. It was maintained around the same time as when I wrote my light novel back in 2010, and there are several short stories which are meant to spin off from that book in here, or which take place further in the timeline of the planned light novel series. There is a cavalcade of short poems, flash fiction, and plans for stories, as well as timetables instructing me on when each one should be tackled. Much of the writing in here actually feels like a light novel. The stylistic influence of the light novels that I'd read at the time is obvious, and my sensibilities as a 20-year-old trying to take off as a writer are pretty obviously in that ballpark. I'm going to transcribe here a story that I read the first paragraph of because it filled me with the sensation that this is what me writing a light novel is probably supposed to look like. It's called Wouldn't That Be Something? Shit. The last and only word that crossed my mind when I realized it was gone. To think that two minutes ago the classroom had been full of students and I was sitting in the back with my iPod Touch on the desk. Two minutes. The time it took for me to go and take a piss and realize it wasn't in my backpack. By the time I returned to the room, it was empty of everything, including my iPod Touch. Fifteen minutes was the preceding time spent scrambling around the building, rechasing my steps and looking desperately for the teacher. She probably picked it up. She probably thinks I left. She'll probably give it to me the next class. Naturally, since she didn't have another class, she was already long gone, like the rest of the students. I remembered her cell phone going off in the last minute of class. I'll bet she had somewhere to be. Not the type to freak out over these little mistakes, I resigned to my fate. My mom wasn't so calm. She told me to go back and look, or check the lost and found, in case the teacher took it there. I reasoned that if she had, it'd be there next time. As much as it sucked, I was patient enough to wait it out. A few hours later, I got a somewhat pleasant surprise. Pleasant in that I love adventure and complications, not in any real good way. It was an email from the girl who picked up my iPod Touch. Thank God that the one bit of info I'd bothered to put in there in the week or so I'd had it was my email address. I didn't bother to ask, but I could probably easily guess how she found it. It had probably fallen off the table, and I hadn't seen it because I sit in the back. I'd probably been five steps out of sight when I searched the classroom, but hadn't been thorough enough. I'm a fucking dumbass. The girl had sent her phone number and said she'd turn it into the lost and found if I didn't respond. What a good girl. I don't want to think she's naive and overly trusting to send her number out. I want to believe she's a truly positive person who doesn't have an ounce of fear. I like those kinds of people. I responded with my class schedule, hoping we could meet at school and make things easy. And I was in luck. We both had class starting at 12.30 the next day. She said we could meet outside the cafeteria at 12.15 for the handoff. This was going to be an open and shut case. I told her I'd be wearing a suit, that my name was Conrad, and that if all else failed, I was the guy with the extraordinarily long hair. A very easy guy to spot. I didn't keep thinking about it much, except to remind myself that I had to show up earlier than usual. There were more pressing matters to attend to, like the speech I'd be giving in the morning that I started writing around midnight. And yeah, that's how the story ends. Pretty fucking anticlimactic. The writing style is super light novel-y though, and what interests me the most is that part in the middle where I suddenly show myself to be incredibly paranoid about other people. Like, the whole way through, I'm portraying myself as this kind of unemotional creature just objectively describing events as they transpired, and even acting like I'm the sane one when my mom very rationally asks me to go check the lost and found, but then I drop this bomb in the middle about how I think this girl is possibly a naive fool because she gave someone her phone number. I don't know what magical properties I believed a phone number to have at the time, but it was definitely not that fucking big a deal. But that's kind of indicative of exactly who I was at the time. A borderline hikikomori with no social skills whatsoever, who never made friends with a single classmate in the two years that I was in college. Truly a light novel author through and through. Anyways, I don't have any better ideas, so how about we transcribe another one? This one has no title, but I think it was from my Tales of the 7-Eleven series, and it has a cute girl in it! Some things happen for no reason at all. They escape our ability to ascribe purpose to them, and we can only accept that something has happened. Often it's something simple, like when my grandfather died. No one could explain how he had died, what had killed him. We had to accept it as a mystery of medical science and move on. Other times it's less simple. Right now I'm wondering, why did a puddle appear on my floor? 
Why is it that what is clearly water has not soaked through my carpet into the floor and started dripping from the ceiling below? Why has something so incomprehensible visited me in a form so easily recognizable, so common? Of course, I'm not really thinking these things. This is an analysis of the situation. I'm actually thinking, what the fuck? And holy shit! At first, I don't touch the water because I wouldn't instinctively touch water. Then I note to myself not to touch it because a rough analysis proves it unusual. Then once I've thoroughly analyzed it, stared at it for a while, and gotten bored with it, I touch it. It is water. Satisfied that it is water of some form and not sure where to go with my curiosity, I think it best to be rid of it. I lay a towel over the puddle. It doesn't soak up any water. It simply floats flatly on the surface. I bunch the towel up to make it more dense, and it still floats, as if a glass plate were covering the puddle. This inspires me to stand in the puddle. I fall through. Even though I experience the sensation of falling, I don't so much land as I do appear in a new location. It seems that I've been teleported into a freezer at a 7-Eleven. Oddly spacious, this freezer. Even so, I'm pressed up against the glass, a bunch of shelves jammed into my backside. Actually, I don't recognize that I'm in a 7-Eleven freezer immediately. My immediate reaction to the situation is getting the hell out of wherever I am because it's cold and painful. My instinctual body movement shoves the door open, and I trip onto my hands and knees. Somewhere mid-fall, it occurs to me where I am. I fumble to my feet, expecting to meet stares of incredulity, but there are no customers in the store. There is only an employee doing whatever it is employees do over by the racks, and she doesn't seem to notice me yet. I have time to observe that she's a mildly attractive 20-something, light brown hair pulled back into a ponytail, small features, really great skin, before she notices me. Great Scott! We've got another one! I'm so totally blown away by her use of the phrase Great Scott that I nearly forget my seconds earlier teleportation from a mysterious puddle into a 7-Eleven freezer. Then I remember and am not sure what to say. Also, she's gotten closer to me. I'm sure you're very confused, she begins with clearly practiced conviction, so allow me to explain. Can I sit down first? I'm blunt with her because I'm almost totally sure that this will take a while. It won't take long. I stand corrected. You were teleported into the freezer by one of the many magical freezer portals. Her sentence concludes with unmistakable finality. That... that explains absolutely nothing. The girl walks past me, picks up a couple of haagen that came down with me, shelves them, and closes the evidently supernatural freezer. Maybe, but that's all there is to know. Unpossible. I pause briefly to regret my use of such a dorky, internet meme sounding word. That may be all that you know, but there is clearly more to be said about the thing happening here. I wonder how I've gotten into a cranky lecture with someone I don't even know before I've begun to take in my situation. She seems to inspire it in me, probably her hipsterish vocabulary like I can talk. Okay, smarty pants, if you'd like to find a better explanation, then be my guest. No, I'll be fine. Am I such a prude that I care about her word choice more than this situation? In any case, I'm far too lazy to attempt a better investigation than what's probably been done. So I take it from your explanation that this happens frequently. I'm starting to wish one of my friends was here so I could go into the requisite DUDE HOLY SHIT and THIS IS FUCKING CRAZY remarks before getting down to business like this. You are correct. It started two months ago. Someone just appeared in the freezer. No one knew what to make of what happened, so we didn't go much into investigation. Until, two days later, it happened again. That's when we found out about the puddles. So we tried to test them and prove that they were portals, but they didn't work. Apparently, there's some discretion at play about who gets dropped into a puddle when. Of ten cases, every person had a puddle which showed up in their room and had fallen through it. The only outlier was a case where a friend fell into the puddle in his friend's room. That one was particularly chaotic. Anyway, after all the interviewing and investigating we did, we only came up with a few facts. First, all of the people who teleported lived within a two-mile radius of this 7-Eleven. Second, the puddles cannot be getting rid of no matter what. We've tried everything short of taking the ground out from under them, though one lady is planning to do that soon. Third, as far as we know, the puddles only lead here. However, no one's been teleported twice, and we have no way of knowing if there are puddles that lead to other places. And that's all we know. At this point, we've given up on understanding the puddles ourselves and are going public with the situation. Though it'll be hard to prove it's not a hoax unless we film someone falling into a puddle. By this point, the girl and I have been walking all over the store, I've cracked open a can of Mountain Dew, a customer has wandered in to buy a pack of cigarettes, and another employee has arrived at the counter to ring him up, assumably having been in the back room or wherever it is that employees hide. 
He, a heavy, curly-haired young man with glasses, has either been silently listening to our exchange in the shadows, or is so desensitized to people appearing from the freezer that he just doesn't give a shit. So, was there no commonality between what people were doing before they fell into the puddle? I sound like a CSI all of a sudden. Nope, not except for that they were all in their rooms and walking. There was a super pro questioner dude asking them stuff I'd never have even thought of, down to if they had any fillings in their teeth or suffered any illnesses. Nothing was totally consistent. Too in character, I almost said, damn it, in frustration over the complications in this case. You looked like you were gonna say damn it. This girl is surprisingly perceptive. I kind of want to. I mean, how can I just go home after all this and try to explain it to someone? Just tell them about the news report coming up and when they see it, they'll know. Uh, but it'll be so awkward at the time. Oh well. You ain't got a lot of choice here, Skippy. She lapsed into a more southern accent, a common tendency among some people in Virginia Beach, stuck in between the high population of black people from New York and the old generation of proper southern old people and not knowing who to sound like. I guess... Wait, did she just call me Skippy? Oh. Well, if you need someone to talk to, I'll be around. And yeah, that's how that one ends. Again, very anticlimactic, but what can you do? This one is actually so light novel sounding that it hurts. Like, the thought that this isn't a parody at all is kind of astounding. My written voice, just honest to God, sounded like that. All of the elements are there. The sarcastic hero who quips about everything that's happening, the cute girl with hyperactive mannerisms who uses weird turns of phrase, the overly long dialogue exposition dumps, the clumsy jokes and flirting, the little pieces of meta humor. It's the real fucking deal. The only weird part is the random history lesson on Virginia Beach dialect at the end. I'm sure I just wanted to tie the story into taking place here because I was obsessed with the idea of making stories that take place here at the time, but it's kind of out of left field tonally and particularly distracting in that it comes right at the end of the story. Not that there was any kind of tension build there anyways. This thing really was designed from the ground up to go nowhere and accomplish nothing. I can't pretend it's not every bit as bad as any light novel I would trash today, it just is a perfect embodiment of them in every way. It's too easy to imagine how if I reworked this premise slightly so that the guy is looking for a job and then the girl convinces him to come work at the 7-Eleven, then we end up with a generic workplace comedy where every few episodes a new cute girl teleports into one of the freezers and joins the cast. It writes itself, 12 episodes, stat. It's worth noting that the stories I've been sharing so far are much more normal and comedically tinged than what I was usually writing at the time. Most of my stories either contained a really heavy sexual element or were a lot darker, moodier, and edgier. There's one more short piece of light novel-esque writing in here that I'd like to share, which is related to the Tales from the End of the World series. I believe it was meant to be a romantic scene between the characters Dark Holy and Scarlet Dream, a pair of little girls who, as children, had been tortured in the production of snuff films and who separately managed to escape. Dark Holy was recruited to a gang, which she would grow up over the next five years to take control of due to her savant intelligence, and Scarlet Dream, who actually was fully killed and was brought back to life by one of the gods who watches over the city and given her own godlike powers, and she was then taken in and looked after by a kind old priest named Seamus. She suffers from multiple personality disorder and is the cause of all kinds of mayhem that takes place within the city, but at this point in the story she's been reunited with Dark Holy, who'd been something of a guardian to her in her childhood, and the two of them are now living together as a couple of sorts. Here's the story, Dark Dreams at Rest. What did the warmth of the young girl's body mean to her? What was the reason for those arms around her torso? Why was it more than just something, but also something else? Was it the action, or was it the girl? In her cerebellum, records were being checked against each other, scrambling for the most appropriate interpretation of the situation. Memories were filtered and sorted to reconcile every instance of this action and every aspect of this girl. In the process, her personality switched. She was not alone inside her head. Others were there to protect her and to make sure that she wouldn't break again. The protector bubbled to the surface, called by the reaction to arms and touching. The protector analyzed the situation. Its host body was laying on a comfortable bed in a dark room. Bed. Memories. Mother. Love. Men. Terror. Girls. Death. Murder. Blood. Seamus. Care. Dark Holy. Dark Holy. The girl whose arms enwrapped her was familiar. Memories from childhood and memories from the past year. A five-year hole in which she didn't exist. Who is Dark Holy? Sister? Lover? killer? No. I killed her. Bed. Terror. Floor. Blood. 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 Love. Love? 
Is that the answer? If so, then what is love? The protector calmly examined the girl's body. A tiny frame, so tiny, so small, and so warm. The warmth radiated from her core. The warmth of her arms was more than the warmth of arms. It was a cable. It connected the girls together, attaching their cores, combining them into a single circuit. It was a warmth inviting her to become one with the girl, a warmth that could only be accessed by a special person, an invitation exclusive to a lover. A lover. The truth. Love is warmth. She understood warmth. Warmth could not harm her. The protector receded. But Scarlet Dream was not ready to come out. The observer emerged. Its job was to analyze a situation that she didn't understand and determine the right response. Contrary to the protector's hard, fixed gaze, the observer made the body's eyes flitter madly around, collecting and constructing every detail. Dark sight, moonlight curtains, night, soft comfort, blanket pillow, bed, girl, dark holy, warm hug, quiet breathing, eyelids, sleep, body, clothes, pajamas, own body, clothes, pajamas, woke from dreaming, bed, large, walls, posters, dark's room, sound, computer, speakers, music, Portugal the man. The observations occurred all at once in their operative senses, and the observer calculated the mood. Love, the only answer it reached. Love, the only explanation. Love, dominating thoughts and senses. The observer retreated. Scarlet Dream emerged. Emotion betrothed observation. Scarlet's eyes fell on Dark's face and didn't bulge. They enamored themselves with the surging, overwhelming love that they had for every particle of her being. Dark's face. Just a few strands of silver hair falling about its frame. The glint of moonlight glowing on her soft cheek. A terrifying scar where she had a right eye before the incident five years ago. Her remaining eyelid, contrastingly smooth and beautiful, kissable like her soft lips. Kissable. Scarlet latched onto that word. It became the desire, the proponent of her love. Kiss. Her face was so close, their bodies entwined. Together. One. Connect. She gently put her arms around Dark's head, cradling it, closing out the world to center on just the two of them. She couldn't decide where to kiss first, so she followed the moonlight and pressed her lips to Dark's cheek. She brushed her own cheek against it. With a natural flow, she moved on to kiss the lips and the forehead. With great care, she kissed the closed eye. With every kiss, saliva gathered in her mouth, and taste began to demand the attention of touch. Her tongue freed itself and gently traced Dark's jaw up to her ear and then started around the edge of the ear itself. You didn't kiss the scar, Dark suddenly murmured, only a bit awake. Scarlet moved her face back down and pressed her forehead against Dark's, looking into the one eye that opened slightly on a smiling face. I'm not allowed to, Scarlet replied, because it's my fault you died. Dark laughed, but I'm right here. I let you die, and I came back. Dark's white eye was now fully open, peering into Scarlet's heart, assuring it of her love. Tears formed in Scarlet's eyes. Dark pressed her hand against Scarlet's hair and brushed it gently. Don't cry, baby. It's not your fault. I never blamed you even once. I've always loved you even more than myself. She brushed Scarlet's tears away with her fingers as she spoke. I love you too, Scarlet said through a cracked voice. Now tears were rolling down her cheeks as she closed her eyes and tucked her head under Dark's face. Dark turned and licked the tears from Scarlet's eyes. At this, a smile spread on Scarlet's face and her crying stopped. She looked back up at Dark and saw that she was smiling too. You're sure it won't hurt? It might, but that's okay. I want this scar to be yours, along with the rest of me. At Dark's command, Scarlet kissed the scar where her eye had once been. Dark tightened her hold of Scarlet's body, pressing into her. Now I'm all yours. Well, that was either the sweetest dang little love story I ever did write, or the cringiest fucking nightmare of edgy bullshit and lolly porn. Who can say for sure? All I know is that there's definitely a universe where I continued writing this way and became a successful light novel author in my early 20s. Back then, I was always unsure of my abilities because I didn't really have any audience at all and what little fiction I posted online was by and large either completely ignored or just wasn't to the taste of the few people I knew who would read it, none of whom would really be into light novels in the first place. Looking over this work now, though, I think I was practically just a minor step below acceptable, at least in terms of voice. Obviously, my biggest problem was that I didn't have enough ideas for actual stories, aside from the fact that most of what I wanted to write about was niche to the point that it would not only creep a lot of people out, but sometimes creeps me out when I have to read back through it. And now, I'm not sure if that person still exists in me. 
After five straight years of gonzo journalism, it's not easy to reconnect with the kind of sincere love of my characters that would have inspired something like Dark Dreams at Rest. Now I either write about myself or I write uber-meta post-post-ironic bullshit like the majority of this book so far. Will I ever find a source of such pure inspiration as I once had in my love of watching cute lesbian lollies have romantic moments together? Only the future can tell, my friends. Anyways, I've milked this notebook enough for now. There's still a few more interesting bits in there that I might dive into when I reach peak creative bankruptcy, but let's move on for now. Chapter 46 Imagine a world in which everyone is a light novel author. Still alive? You're made of sterner stuff than I thought. Most folks kill themselves at the mere thought. How would you like to join an elite paramilitary unit of light novel author assassins? You can be a part of one of the bravest initiatives on planet Earth to cleanse our beautiful world of a scourge that has plagued us for far too long and taken far too many lives. I won't lie, you'll see some ugly things in this line of work. Ten-year-old Emotos with gigantic tits, 90-year-old vampires who look like how ten-year-olds are supposed to look, unassuming teenagers with more pussy shoved in their face than you knew existed, just because they're good at playing a video game. It's the sort of sights that might seep into your subconscious and haunt you for the rest of your life if you're not careful. In this line of work we have a motto, a clean kill means you never see anything in the guy's room. You don't want to know what the sick fuckers who make these stories surround themselves with. So what do you say, soldier? Have you got the stones to trip headlong into the tits of an unholy realm of perversion, all to protect this beautiful planet that God trusted us with? Or do you have anime sweat drops on your back just thinking about it? Let us know any time. We're always looking for new recruits. It's a nasty ass war, but someone's gotta fight it. Chapter 47 It's raining like Southeast Asia outside. I don't know what it is about having a smoke out by the loudly active gutter which makes me nostalgic for the month that I spent in the Philippines in 2011. When I think about it, flying across the globe to live with a fellow anime blogger for a month is surely the most interesting thing that I've ever done, yet there's some irony in the fact that it happened before I became something of a minor celebrity who actually leads an interesting life. I have to wonder then if that trip flipped some kind of switch, if that was the start of the journey that I found myself on. I've given several interviews to conventional news publications, and they tend to focus on the fact that I left a job at Target to pursue a career on YouTube, and they tend to frame that as a sort of starting point. But they're missing the bigger picture, which is that I only got the job at Target in the first place because I had decided to become a YouTuber, and I wanted enough money to afford the equipment that I needed to do it. So I got the job, immediately bought all of the equipment with my first few paychecks, and then left the job as soon as my career started to take off, which by all accounts was shocking fast. I worked that job for less than six months, and by the time I'd even started it, I was already Digibro, the man so obsessed with his own creativity that he was eventually consumed by it and doesn't know how to live normally anymore. But it's hard to delineate a before and after point. When I look back on my life, it all seems like such a natural progression. Of course the kid that I was would become the teenager that I was, and the man that I am now. I was always doing the same kinds of things and progressing in my skills at such a natural incline that it's almost comical to follow along with. How could I ever have been anything else? And yet, when you look at it from the outside, there really has to be a definitive moment when I go from just some kid to an outsider artist. Because if you just look at me from before as a high schooler who spent most of his time in class writing, or a college kid who paid more attention to anime and struggling to get his novel finished than doing classwork, then you're really describing a lot of people. Surely there are millions of kids who were basically just like I was, and yet somehow I'm the one who managed to make it into a career and to continue doing the same thing for the next half a decade while they didn't make it that far. So where was the cutoff moment? When did I become a professional in mindset while they didn't? Was it the moment I started making money? Was it the moment that my work was recognized by an audience? Because you can't have those things at the starting line. You have to already be good before you can be recognized for being good. So when did I get good? It's hard not to point to the month in the Philippines, spent with a man whom I've repeatedly referred to as my mentor over the years, and who has indeed even embraced that title. Even though for the next year and some change after that visit, I did virtually nothing with my life. I had dropped out of college just beforehand and never went back, I was supposed to get a job but never did, my mom was admitted to the hospital with near-fatal cancer that fall, and I used that as an excuse to hole up in my room and continue to not do shit. 
I wasn't even that active in my writing. I wasted a solid year after that time in the Philippines before I found out about the potential to have a career on YouTube, and then I rushed into it headlong with such ferocity that I didn't even look like the same person to myself anymore. Somehow, the drive that I developed in that moment transformed me entirely from someone who spent more time wanting to be making something than actually making anything to someone who spends so much time making stuff that I rarely have the chance to even think about what it is I'm actually making. So it's hard to say when the flip was switched, at what moment I was classifiably different. If you took stock of every aspect of my life and upbringing, then you would by no means consider any part of it to have been wholly normal. Maybe you'd even think that someone with a life like mine was destined to become an artist. But I have to think that the sheer oddness of that trip to the Philippines, the mere idea of a 19 year old American white kid going across the planet to share a roof with an anime blogger 15 years his senior and his family, which maybe isn't a scenario that's ever happened on quite those terms in human history, was the moment of my awakening. Even though for a long time I felt regret for not capitalizing on that trip to anywhere near the extent that I could have, I spent way too much time alone in the house, too afraid to venture out on my own, I only half learned a lot of what my mentor tried to teach me, and only read a couple of his books. I didn't write nearly as much about the experience as I'd hoped to, I barely covered it at all or did a whole lot of writing while I was there, all of the pictures I took, of which there weren't that many of relevance, were lost. And yet, it's hard not to imagine that the experience was nonetheless fundamental in making me into someone who could never again return to the idea that my life was ever going to approach averageness. Taking that trip was perhaps what solidified the already potent idea in my mind that I was going to do something different with my life, and that's why my mind returns to it so often, even six years after it first happened. I wasn't just a kid whose username was Digital Boy anymore when I came home from that trip. I was Digibro, the otaku gonzo journalist. Chapter 48. This is Damien Burger Sandwich, a boy who's so good at playing Yu-Gi-Oh cards that he can get any woman to have sex with him. This is not necessarily to say that any woman would be so impressed with his skills at the children's card game that they would want to ride his nuts, though there are some women who will feel that way after watching him play. Rather, it is to say that through a variety of highly specific circumstances, his card game playing can lead to any woman finding herself in a willing sexual encounter with him. For instance, there was the time that Damien won the championship battle against Bick Ferdley at the all-county Big Champs Yu-Gi-Off. There was a million dollars on the line, and Bick's mother was in jail with cancer, so he was planning to use the money to bail her out and cure her. A lot was on the line. In the middle of the match, Damien operated his patented power play of smacking down his opponent's monsters with the spell card, Windy Bimby. His play was so strong that the elements themselves hummed with resonance, and an enormous gust of wind billowed into the playing hall. Given that Damien is a weak bitch physically, he was promptly blown off of his feet and into a nearby vat of all-natural nuclear goo. This goo would have killed any normal man, but because Damien was carrying all five pieces of Exodia in his back pocket just in case he'd have to cheat to win, the cosmic powers aligned and granted him with the temporary ability to cure cancer with his sperm. Once Damien crawled out of the vat, his clothes all having melted away, he promptly pulverized his opponent and took the million dollars for himself. Before he could leave the arena, Big Ferdley fell to his knees before Damien and begged him, Please, Damien, you son of a bitch, please fuck my mom, I need this. And so Damien bailed Big's mother out of jail so that he could fuck her and was surprised how much he enjoyed it. It definitely helped that he demanded Bick watch from the side of the bed while he made it rain over his mother's bare back with the remainder of his winnings while she screamed his name alongside proclamations of the quality of his performance. Then there was the time that Damien challenged the God of Rabbits to a duel to decide who would reap the harvest of the village's carrot field in the upcoming solstice. The God of Rabbits reminded Damien that he had been receiving tribute for 300 years and that all who opposed him had met unfortunate tickling related fatalities before their souls were trapped in the Shadow Realm. Damien merely chortled, retorting, Bitch, I invented the Shadow Realm, before beginning the throwdown. For a brief moment, the God of Rabbits believed himself to have the upper hand when he played the desk of unsorted rental returns against Damien's eyeball catastrophe. However, that's when Damien turned the tide with the one in 40 or so draw of unironic winky face, utterly decimating the remainder of his opponent's life points. The God of Rabbits was so shamed by his loss that he took all of his rabbits out of the village to go fuck around somewhere in the Japanese mountainside, and the villagers all enjoyed a long winter of many steamed carrots. 
Then one day, Damien was eating a carrot out by the side of his cottage while jacking off, and a woman who was doing roof work up above slipped on a carrot that someone had gotten sick of eating and chucked up on the roof, and since she wasn't wearing any underwear, she managed to land directly on Damien's dick in such a way that it went straight into her womb right as he was coming, impregnating her instantly. It just so happened that she'd been trying to get pregnant for months, but thanks to the plague of curses which the god of rabbits had placed on the carrots that everyone was constantly eating, no one in the village was virile anymore. Damien was lucky that he'd just happened to slip on a carrot into a vat of all-natural nuclear goo, which had made him resistant to the curse and virile to a fault. Upon hearing about Damien's existent sperm, he was then made to have sex with every girl in the village, shrinking their gene pool considerably, but providing them with godlike sons. Now I know what you're thinking. That's all well and good, but what in the fuck is a burger sandwich? I'm glad you asked. A burger sandwich is when you take a sandwich full of ground beef and use burger patties as the buns. Stacked up, that means a burger patty topped by a slice of bread, topped by ground beef and your choice of condiments, topped by another slice of bread, topped by another burger patty. Delicious though they may be, far more popular is the burger sandwich burger, which is the same thing but with an additional bun around it, so that you don't get grease all over your goddamn hands. Of course, this is only a problem if you're a coward, which is why it's no surprise that Damien's Nadesake is the more pure version of the food stuff. Chapter 49 I have a strange obsession with and reverence for notebooks. In fact, for a long time, I think it was counterintuitive to actually getting anything done. Every time I started out a new notebook, I would try to make it pristine, with very well laid out pages full of carefully written text and no wasted words. I always wanted to approach it as if I was writing the finalized story bible of whatever fiction I was taking notes for, and so that I would continue to take it seriously and feel the freshness of writing in such a pristine journal. But then I would freeze up after just a few pages because I didn't have enough ideas that felt concrete enough to be worthy of the notebook, and then at some point later, when an actual frantic dash of inspiration came, just grab the first notebook that I saw and slap whatever was on my mind onto the page. As a result, the notebook would immediately enter a state of disarray, and then I'd be dissatisfied with it and want to start again with a new notebook. This is why most of my notebooks have stuff on the first few pages and on the last few pages, or on such for each individual section where applicable, but often little in between. Rather than fill out the rest of the book, I was always in search of a fresh start, so I'd get a new one entirely. You can almost tell how old I was when working with a particular notebook just by how many pages are written on. From my early and mid-teens, there are gigantic notebooks with barely any writing in them, and lots of crappy drawings or random song lyrics. Meanwhile, in my 20s, there are smaller and smaller, more portable notebooks nearly filled from front to back. Eventually, they become planner-sized, and mostly filled with hastily written notes about whatever project I was working on at the time. Rarely is a book now focused on plans that I have for stories I want to write in the future. Now they are more filled with barely comprehensible no notations written while in the process of already creating something. It's to the point now where I don't even stay confined to one notebook or even to notebooks in themselves. Now I just grab the first one that I see lying around and open to the first blank page that I can find, or otherwise open up a notepad to scrawl something else, or to write on a small whiteboard to take notes on whatever I might be watching. The fact that I don't see the need for all of my note-taking to remain permanent anymore speaks to the fact that these days, whatever I'm taking notes for probably actually exists by the time I'm done with it. It can be tempting to view these notebooks as monuments to failure, as graveyards for unfinished ideas that I never got around to. Some of them definitely feel that way, especially the ones which are chock full of schedules and lists and plans for what I'm working on. I'll find an extensive plan for the coming week of writing, which I know I did not write one single item on. But many of these notebooks are actually teeming with life. The ones where I actually did write something out, even if unfinished, are brimming with the creative desire I was harboring towards them. It's why I can't let go of so many of these concepts, why I'm still describing to this day story ideas that I came up with more than six years ago and never really did anything with, but can't seem to put out of mind. I can just see how much passion and desire I had for them at the time, and it makes me want them to be real. I've often stumbled upon this loose page in my drawer called Currently Active Projects. I can't possibly tell you what year it was made in because none of the projects on the page could ever really have been described as currently active. I can only tell from the fact that Cyrano and Purple Steve isn't on the list that it must have been before 2011. There are literally 16 different stories on this page, all of which had been planned to various degrees, and most of which I was pretty serious about. This wasn't just a list of every single idea I'd ever had, this was what I considered to be currently active projects. 
There is only one of these that I wrote more than a thousand words of, and that was Tales from the End of the World. Everything else on the list never even got started, never made it past the pages of those notebooks. Yet if I found myself suddenly with the talent and desire to dedicate myself to writing fiction, I have no doubt that I would try to return to each of these stories. Most of them are concepts which I would never come up with today, but they're just so deeply ingrained into my consciousness that the thought of letting them go is not an option. Even though there is no part of me that actually wants to go through with writing some of these, my desire for them to exist, to justify all of the time that I've spent thinking of them, is so much that I can't even put out of mind the idea that I might go headlong into writing fiction one day. I just can't discount the possibility. Chapter 50. Okay, I've gone through enough of my old notebooks for now to invoke some bubbling self-hatred, so it's time to quit while I'm ahead. I can only have so much affection towards this old work. Some of it is infuriatingly pretentious, terribly written, and a monument to my own laziness and inability to complete anything, and that's just frustrating. Really, that book which I was taking stories from earlier is the only one that I find consistently interesting, even if a lot of it is still random plans and bullshit poems and the like. I really think that notebook was the beginning and end of the time when I was a promising fiction writer. Everything up until that point is insufferable, and everything after that point is when I dedicated myself to writing analytically and journalistically, so it's really around the end of that notebook that my fiction career died, at least until now, if you can call this a revival. There's still a couple more things that I might as well share from that book before I completely move on and try to think of more original shit again. The first story in the book is terrible, but interesting in concept. It's called Takaso Wedding Video Introduction, and is a tie-in story to the tales of the end of the world, taking place way further into the timeline, when the character So Anryo, who was like 13 in the first book, has grown up and is apparently getting married to her partner in crime, Takasu, who is much older. In retrospect, I don't know how I feel about this potential development, and I certainly hate how this short story is written. However, what I like about it is that it takes the form of a dialogue scene in which the characters are explaining how they met and how their relationship developed up to this point as the introduction to their wedding tape. I think it's a pretty adorable idea, and I like how the characters sort of bicker and flirt their way through telling their story, but I just hate that it's these particular characters hooking up in this particular way. A few pages later, there is what I intended to be a prologue to the first book of Tales from the End of the World called The Watching. What I find most interesting about its placement in the notebook is that there are two pages of notes laying out the structure of the story. Not continuous notes, but one page is a reconsolidated version of the previous page's notes in a clearer order. Then over on the next three pages is the story itself, comprised entirely of dialogue between Scarlet Dream's multiple personalities. I'd copy it here, but frankly I find it obnoxious. Later in the book, there are 10 or 11 pages of extensive character bios and world-building notes for a story I'd planned called Maho Shoujo to Henshin Papa. The idea was that a little girl gets magical girl powers at the same time that her father gets transforming hero powers, unbeknownst to one another and under totally different circumstances. At first, they are fighting their battles in secret until their enemies join forces, and so too do they. The magical girl element was to be a straight riff on the pre-cure formula, while the transforming hero part would be more along the lines of Giver, but at the heart of it would be a story about a family coming together. This has always been one of my favorite story concepts, and I've wanted it brought to life. At one point, I had someone take an interest in the story, and I gave them access to the blog I'd made for it. They wrote a few chapters before giving up, but I think they were always hoping I'd actually read it or share it around. Personally, though, I felt the writing was much too amateurish to really deliver on the story in the way I wanted it, which just means, once again, we've got to get a Kickstarter going to hire a professional. Anyways, that's enough dragging my feet with all this old ass shit. I know you want this to be a funny meme book, and so do I, it's just that there's only so much I can come up with in a single night. I'd ask you for suggestions right here and now, but as the voice of our generation, Drake, once said, if you're reading this, it's too late. Chapter 51 I have a strange condition which I was really reminded of in full force by reading all of those old notebooks, and which is still as true now as it was then. I love writing erotic fiction. I love imagining erotic scenarios. I love crafting these strange, fetishistic love scenes tailored to my incredibly specific interests. And yet, against perhaps my better judgment, and against the entire basis of what many would see as my identity, I am embarrassed about them. I am embarrassed about them while writing them, and thrice as much so when sharing them or talking about them. I want to sweep them under the rug and pretend they aren't me, or to release them under an anonymous pseudonym, which might sound easy enough, but getting anyone to read your shit if you're a nobody never stops being hard, and if I can't leverage my moderate internet fame for readership, then I'm completely fucked. Case in point, this book. I'm not even sure why this is, because I don't know what I'm trying to hide exactly. It's not as though anyone on Earth doesn't already think of me as a weird lollicon sex pervert. For Christ's sakes, there's an anime girl touching herself on my ceiling, but if there's one thing which 
which I absolutely don't want happening. It's people addressing me for my sexual interests. There's nothing that I fear more than people approaching me to talk about how they feel about my sexual preferences or chatting with me about the porn they know I look at or anything along those lines. It's not that I'm incapable of talking about it, and when the person feels similarly to how I do, then it's not even that bad. But the thought of someone judging me because of what I like to jack off to or fantasize about is just completely unacceptable. I don't want anyone thinking about what I do with my dick in the privacy of my own home at any given time. Which is all really kind of strange, given the way I am about literally anything else, and given that it would be nice to have an outlet to express all of those ideas. Of course, if there is someone who would really resonate with my erotic fiction, then I'd like them to be able to read it. I just want them to not think of it as me who did it. I want some kind of abstraction, or for it to be enjoyed without ever having to know it was me. I just want it to be out there. I think I'm a lot more guarded than my public persona would leave most to believe. Even when it comes to my music, there's always a strong sense of hesitation when it comes to posting it or reading reactions to it. In that case, because the music is so tailored to my particular interests and style, it isn't meant to be consumable to a wide audience. It isn't meant to be something that just anyone could enjoy, and yet to get it into the hands of those who would, or to introduce them to it, I have to release it as widely as I can, and therefore invite plenty of people who would have no reason to look at it, to listen to it and judge it and comment on it, which I don't want, because the point of it was never to appeal to those people. It was never meant to get into their heads. Doing so was merely a consequence of getting it to the people who will want it. And when it comes to erotic stories, the same is true but tenfold. Opening myself up to something as personal as that is just an invitation for ridicule and memory from anyone who doesn't care or doesn't get it. And moreover, those who do get it may be over-eager in their appreciation and just give me more information than I ever wanted about their relationship to it. It's just all around a weird position to be in for someone who isn't trying to make a career as an erotic storyteller, and who isn't all that concerned over whether it has a mass appeal, yet will have to promote it on some level to a mass audience in order to find its demographic. But at least at this point I'm already used to it, or getting there anyways. For a very long time I wouldn't talk about sex or sexuality on any kind of personal level in public. I tried my hardest to avoid fetishistic topics or to bring up what I like in erotic fiction, but at this point I feel like everything has to go. There's nothing I can hide anymore because I've already given up on the idea of me as a person and given in to the idea of me as a meme, a celebrity, a performance art piece of a human being, a consciousness whose every thought must be made bare for the audience to indulge in. There's nothing I have left that isn't on display, so why not go all the way? Turn up the lights in here, baby. Extra bright, I want y'all to see this. Chapter 52 I was 24 at the time, and I could tell she wasn't any more than 16 the second I laid eyes on her. Ordinarily, it wouldn't matter how legal that was in this county, I was morally obligated not to take a step closer, but this time was a little different. It wasn't just the air she had about her, obviously no child and no virgin, and subtly mature in ways that told me her life had taken her places it shouldn't have at such an age yet, but left her tough as nails for it. No, it was also the location, the back deck of a restaurant where I'm not sure how she got served a glass of wine, but there she was, arm on the patio railing, a cigarette in one hand and drink in the other, with full red lipstick and redder eyes that dazzled amidst the sparkling blonde hair she had tied up in the back. She wasn't even particularly dressed up, a snugly fitting white button-up blouse with some flower printing and slim denim jeans rolled up to just below her knees. There was enough beauty on display to captivate regardless in both her slim, well-kept figure and the personality emanating from the way she stood and the combination of everything she had going on. In this case, it didn't only not matter how young she was, but I couldn't deny it made her even more interesting. There was nothing I didn't want to know, so I had to ask. American spirits, huh? That's a bitter taste for a sweet young lady. She shrugged. Just whatever my last girlfriend left in the apartment. I don't hate him, though. I was already in. A girl like this wasn't going to bring up her ex-girlfriend when addressing an older woman who just started flirting with her if she wasn't interested. You happen to be looking for a replacement? I asked, hamming it up big time tonight for some reason. She already had the coolness game locked down, so I wasn't even going to try. Girlfriend or smokes? I could take both. I pulled out a box of Camel Crush, opened it, and gestured it towards her. I come with these, I said. Oh, uh -huh, my favorite, the girl said, immediately tossing the one that she was smoking off of the balcony and reaching to take one from the box. I whipped out a Zippo and lit her cigarette for her before pulling out and lighting one for myself. My name's Avery. I'm from around here, I said as I took a puff. Elsa. I'm not. She took a sip of wine. As she spoke, she seemed to stare off into the middle distance, but after a moment she noticed me staring at her and finally made eye contact. 
I could tell she wasn't entirely sure where she wanted this conversation to go. I'd have to be a bit more charming from here on out. Running away from something? I asked. Sure, you could say that. Maybe getting away more so than running. I couldn't stop looking at her. She was the type of woman that's so imminently attractive and fine-tuned to my taste that I kept choking down a declaration that I want her to marry me on the spot. Well, hey, if you're in town for a while, I know all the best stuff to do, and I'd be happy to show you around. Always happy to escort a beautiful young lady if it means I get to walk next to her. I was falling apart. My corny approach was going too far, and I was just getting awkward. The sinking feeling that I was not interesting enough for this girl was starting to settle in. I thought that I was probably boring her, and would continue to bore her if I made her keep listening to me. I felt like she would eventually start hoping I'd give up and move on so that she could enjoy herself in peace with her own intrigue and whatever she was thinking about. I might like that, she then responded, and I breathed an inward sigh of some relief before scrambling to think of another thing to say. But she spoke first. Hey, so, listen, I don't really know how to flirt in a place like this. I came here because I wanted to find a pretty lady to take me home after I got smashed on as much of a bottle of wine as I could make it through, and you, you caught me on the first cup. So, what do you say you help me polish off this bottle, and then we go back to your place and make out and sleep together? I was blown away, and not really sure how to respond, so I just picked up a glass from the table and held it out so that she could fill it with wine, and then she filled her own glass, and we tied our arms around one another's for a toast before downing the glasses. From that point on, our conversation began to flow. She told me about how she dropped out of high school to live with her older girlfriend, but when they broke up, she couldn't move back in with her parents, who were pissed off and had disowned her, so she was planning to couch surf with any random woman who would let her sleep with them until she could get a job. I told her that I worked from home as a freelance internet writer and had been looking for a live-in sexual partner to deal with the crippling loneliness that accompanies being alone in your 20s when most of your old friends have moved away or started family. We got progressively drunker as I ordered up a second bottle, having clearly taken more initiative on polishing off the first than she had. Our waiter flashed a concerned look when he looked at Elsa and possibly realized that he hadn't remembered checking her ID or seeing her come in, but since she had already been drinking, he seemingly found it best not to question it. As 1am rolled around and it got a little chilly on the back porch, where everyone else had cleared out, we were making out pretty hard. I finally called an Uber to come pick us up, and we made out pretty intensely on the ride to my house, to the probable chagrin of our driver. After that point was a blur of lips and fingers caressing one another's bodies for an hour or so in a drunken, fumbling way. I was just lucid enough to remember all of it the next day, but Elsa's recollection was spottier after the point we'd hit the bedroom. I remembered the part where she asked me to tie her arms behind her head, and I fumbled with trying to make a knot out of a t-shirt for five minutes without her arms easily slipping out. She didn't. When she woke up an hour after me with a searing headache, I already had Alka-Seltzer and a shot of vinegar ready for her. I asked if she wanted to try a raw egg, but she was unenthused. Half an hour later or so, she had enough vigor to hop in the shower with me, and we quickly resumed where the night had left off, both of us even more impressed with one another's bodies in the daylight. I felt lucky not only to be able to touch a body this tight at my age, but even within my lifetime. She was without a doubt the most beautiful girl I'd ever had sex with, and though I thought for sure she'd be more attracted to me as a homeowner than as a woman, she made love to me with the passion as though she'd had a crush on me for a whole year and only just confessed. I offered her a place to stay for as long as it might take her to get her life together, but in the end, she never left me. We turned out to have the same sense of humor and certainly the same idea of fun. I spent most of my time at the house and she wasn't the biggest fan of people. When we did go out, it was mostly to drink. She eventually found work and took it surprisingly well. Eventually, we moved into a slightly bigger place and started domesticating. I don't know how I got as lucky as this, but I'm definitely not complaining. Tomorrow, I think I'm going to ask her to marry me. Wish me luck. Chapter 53. There you go, a cute little awkward lesbian love story. Didn't even really end up being all that sexual, but them's the breaks. God, it's really been a long time since I tried to write anything like that, and forever since I tried to write dialogue. What better workaround for your dialogue sounding shitty and awkward than to make the characters awkward and bad at flirting? Self-awareness is the one-stop ticket to good writing. Just call attention to what's shitty about your story, and no one can criticize it anymore. Anyways, I don't know why I like writing lesbian hookup stories as much as I do, or if anyone finds them particularly interesting, but in my world, every girl gets a happy ending, as long as it's with another girl. Chapter 54 once there was a witch called Sally the Bitch. She was better known for her bitchiness than her witchiness, of which she was mediocre. She flew around on a magic mop in a crop top with a bob hairdo and saggy tits that billowed in the brawless wind. You'd know she'd passed by from the cigarette smokestack left in her wake. Everyone had heard she'd be leaving town soon and they hoped it was true, but every couple of weeks they'd catch sight of her again and wonder when the hell she was taking off. 
It might not have been so bad if the hag's hairs weren't always riding the wind into random pies, poisoning them into a blackened tar instantly. But the day she finally disappeared, she left behind a really nice tree in the town square patch where they'd started to think that the grass didn't grow anymore. She left no trace it was her, but the way the bark matched her usual chroma schemata made it obvious it was her doing, and no one ever saw her again. They figured they'd broken even on her existence, and it was fine if she never came back, but maybe if she did, they'd be okay with it for a little while. Chapter 55 The sky is pink like lemonade over a busy day in Neo-France. Proletariat Peru's cafe coffee stops with cigarettes, each longer than the last, hung languidly from so many mouths. One by one, they sigh, sip, and dash ashes across so many trays. Je ne veux pas travailler, they all sing in their minds in perfect harmony, staring up at the Neo Eiffel Tower and wondering what they did to deserve it being colored yellow. None of them have ever been to France, but their souls are filled with passionate disdain and a finer taste than whoever must have built this godforsaken colony. Each of them burns through stick after stick, hoping their cumulative smoke clouds could make the day as overcast as their hearts. One day this place will go up in smoke, a man thinks longingly as he lounges in a beautifully handcrafted wooden chair. One day we all get to die. Chapter 56 Moody Lil Patootie was a fruity lil gal with a lightly freckled face and a lollipop in her mouth that said she knew her appeal and did it proud. She could pass for whatever age you like to imagine she was, with hair colored like the sun and shorts that might as well have not existed. Her top was so loose that from any angle you'd be sure you just barely saw the fringe of pink, but could never quite be sure, so you'd just go on staring and staring. She was at the bar strutting hard when a 6'5 gorilla man thundered up beside her with a blush that said he'd never done this before. Moody knew to be worried. She could already tell this Dumbo was deep in love and dead set on getting her to himself. First she thought to scare him off, but with one of his hands big enough to span her torso, she couldn't contain her curiosity. She tried to make it easy on him and not mention a price. He'd be good for it. Whether or not she'd take up the inevitable offer for a place to stay was another story. Twenty minutes and enough beers to weaken his constitution later, his enormous mouth was all over her body. The foreplay was hardly necessary. The anticipation was killing her. She wrestled his belt away and went straight for the goods, only to be greeted perhaps by more than she'd been ready to handle. Anaconda? Python? What was the name of the biggest snake again? She was drawing a blank, and her mind would be going the same way when he tried to stuff that monster into her tiny body. Too big to fit? Could there be anyone that wasn't true for? This was way beyond a fun curiosity. This had become a full-blown test of metal, a challenge run to see if she was all that she was cracked up to be. It was more pride than pleasure which carried her through the mercifully brief encounter before the man pulled out and shot enough to cover most of her torso, and then, thank God, rolled to the side and passed out. Moody grabbed a towel from the bathroom and cleaned herself off took a large clip of money from the man's wallet, and promptly marched down to the bus station. She had no regrets, this was a learning experience, but she definitely didn't want to be anywhere in a five mile radius of a cock that huge again. Chapter 57 Today was the fucking day. The day that all those bastard men with their loud stomping authority and their thick-skulled mansplain brains were going to fucking pay. It had been in the works for years. Science had said it was merely a myth, a chauvinist conspiracy to explain why a building full of women would all turn on the same douchebag, but they'd found a way to make it real, and it was going to work in their favor for once. Every single lady at the office had spent years manipulating birth control and huffing bath salts until they were timed just right for the day of revenge. It would happen right after lunch, when the buffoons were at their fattest and most immobile. The women were all deathly silent, nodding at one another in coded gestures, confirming the attack to come. All they needed was the signal, the first man to crack a joke about how much work they were getting done with it being quiet in here for once. As soon as those words left some 29-year-old wannabe pickup artist's mouth, every woman in the office screamed at once and let loose the flood. Synchronized menstrual explosion. From each and every uterus, a red tide crashed forth, and in the frenzy of screams, lights flickering and floor rumbling, all of the men were thrown off balance, so they couldn't brace themselves for the blood flood. It only took a few minutes. The Red Sea's currents were brutally effective, flinging men right off of their feet, through the halls, and clear out the windows of the high-rise building. The screams and streams pushed on and on until every last man and every last drop of blood had been blasted from the building. When the dust finally settled and each of the women regained composure, they promptly set about to putting the office back in order and getting back to work. Their profits and efficiency went up almost overnight, the wage gap was closed, and none of them ever suffered a period again for the rest of their lives. Eventually, that brave group of women would collectively become the President of the United States and end world hunger forever. Chapter 58 
And that concludes our flash fiction based on forward suggestions from Twitter section. I could probably make an entire book of bullshit like that, but it takes just slightly too long to come up with ideas, and I really want this book to be over with as fast as possible. When I'm just literally talking like I am right now, I can get a whole paragraph out in like a minute and a half as opposed to five minutes, so it's a great way to pad this shit out while I try to think of what to do for the next segment. Chapter 59 so at this point, it may be a wise idea to break down exactly what a light novel is, and whether or not what I'm doing here can even be classified as one. I mean, if I call it a light novel, then that's all well and fine, but would it ever be characterized as one if described by others? The fact that it isn't Japanese would most likely preclude it from being included in any list of light novels online, and the fact that it's a total crock of bullshit would preclude it from anyone trying to argue for why it ought to be included on said lists. But here's how a light novel is characterized. Most would assume that a light novel is defined by its length, meaning that the novel is literally light in weight to hold. This is not the case, and light novels vary wildly in length. On the shorter end of the spectrum, you have stuff like the Katanagatari books, which I've seen in person and were very short, very light on text, and heavy on images, and by my estimate are probably 30,000 words or less. The first book of Sword Art Online Progressive has to be close to 90,000, and I'm pretty sure the first book of Horizon on the Middle of Nowhere is like a good 200,000 or more. That shit is enormous. Light novels are considered to average around 40 to 50,000 words, though. Oftentimes, the first one in the series is the longest since it has to set up the world characters and basic premise, but the other books will vary in length depending on the story. Personally, I've decided to shoot for 40,000 words because any less than that might look like a cop-out. It's hard to say what the characters in Edo Manga Sensei actually produced in their ridiculous writing binges. The manuscripts which Elf Sensei and the main character guy hand one another in episode 4 are fairly small. I'm at about 35,000 words and I'm creeping up on 60 pages in Google Docs. That's with a very text-dense story of barely any dialogue and tons of utterly massive unbroken paragraphs. Frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if each of their stories was significantly shorter than this one, though you could argue that this is just the fault of the show's shitty production and lack of attention to detail, and that we're meant to believe that those books were actually 40 or 50,000 words long. Again, it's hard to say, but I don't want anyone to say I'm a punk ass because I decided to err on the shortest possible side of what a light novel can be. Even making it less than 50,000 seems like a bit of a stretch since that's probably closer to average, but I've seen enough thinner light novels to know that this length is possible even for a first volume, so that's what we're going with. But the real reason that they're called light novels is because they are easy to read. Light novels are characterized by using simplistic language in kanji, and by having tons of dialogue and constant paragraph breaks. This is why I said that stuff I wrote seven years ago was way more in line with what a light novel is supposed to be. Those stories were actually formatted in the way that a typical light novel is, a format which I now find largely insufferable to read. So by that definition, this is a lot more difficult to classify as a light novel. The language of this book is casual and breezy, though I am known to break out $10 words without much hesitation, and some parts of this might be a little more high-minded than what is typical of the medium. That's not me being pretentious, it's just a statement about the style of what is considered a light novel. It's not that a light novel author has to be stupid, but that as soon as you start bringing more advanced language and concepts into the writing, then it starts to become a regular novel and not a light one. Not to mention, most light novels are dialogue heavy, and this book contains barely any dialogue whatsoever. It's almost purely narration. However, these aren't the only characteristics of a light novel. Another thing they're known for is illustrations. The number of illustrations per book can vary wildly from story to story. Some light novels only have anime art on the cover or in small snippets over the course of the story, while others have extensive character and scene illustrations. It just depends on the material. I don't think it's even an absolute requirement that drawings be involved at all. There may or may not be an illustration in the audiobook upload on YouTube, depending on whether or not I have time to shit one out before uploading this, but I certainly can't say that there's enough illustration in here to necessitate the consideration of it as a light novel. Then there's the all-important aspect of relating to anime, manga, video games, and general otaku culture. If you're writing a light novel, it's most likely because you're a gigantic nerd who's into all kinds of nerdy bullshit. In fact, a lot of light novels, especially modern ones, are characterized by attempting to play around with the meta aspects of nerd culture, or of light novels themselves, and to comment on them or subvert them in their tropes in some way. Now this is really where this book fucked up. Not even a single sentence of this entire story deals with the meta of light novels or tries to subvert or deconstruct them at all. As a result, I think it's fair to say that this entire endeavor has been a massive failure. Pack it in, boys. It's time to go home. Chapter 60. Just kidding, I still have 4,000 words to go. Is it wrong that I want a solar flare to fuck up the eyes of every woman on Earth so they all have to wear glasses? Glasses are fucking hot. 
I guess I haven't done an isekai thing yet. Uh, idiot otaku gets sent to another world, bangs 42 virgins, plot twist is he's actually dead, he was really an Isis otaku all along. Done. What's next? I just want this to be over. Please, God, give me something to bullshit about for 4,000 words. I just want to move on. I have to read a whole book tonight for this book club podcast I didn't realize was happening tomorrow morning, and Ben's moving out tonight, so I'm probably going to have some going away festivities with him, and he wants to record a Let's Play or something, and I just need this bullshit to be over with already. Please. Chapter 61. Hey, remember how back in the late 90s and early 2000s, Kinoko Nasu and Kadono Kohei would always have one full page in their stories of just repeating a single phrase like, no one, no one, no one, or this chair, this chair, this chair, etc.? Well, strap in, folks. This book, 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 this this book, 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 this this book, 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 there. That may have been an easy shortcut to padding out the book length, but it was a bitch to do an audiobook form, so I'm sure you can still appreciate the effort. If not, fuck you, I don't care. That literally shot me up almost a thousand words for no effort at all. I probably could have gotten away with making that the entire rest of the book, just to end it in the most hilariously horrible way possible, but I didn't for some reason. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, that really would have been a great idea. I mean, I don't exactly have any other ideas for how I'm going to end this goddamn thing. Would it be right to close off with anything other than a huge meme? 
it's not like there's any plot threads I've got left hanging or thematic messages that haven't been fully explored yet. I'm literally just padding for words at this point. So, yeah, fuck it. Let's just do what we all know is right. Chant along with me. Chant until your jaw hurts and you're not sure who you are anymore. It's time to become one with the light novel. Let's go. This book, 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 this book 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 this book, 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 this book. This book, 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 this this book, 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 this this book, 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 this this book, 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 this
This book, 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 this book. This book, 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 book, this 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 book. Book. This book, 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 Book, this 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 this book. This book, 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 this book. This book, 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 this book. This book, 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 this book. This book, 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 this book. This book, 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 this book fucking sucks.